I'm sorry for the delay, but we're ready to start. So may I ask everyone to um, settle in and um, I'll call this meeting to this hearing to order. Um, this is the hearing on the future of I'm health. Sorry for the delay. And I welcome all of you. But we're ready um, to start. So we may have um, everyone to, various um, resource persons to deal with point of view and, and think um, around that. I'll call this meeting so, to, um, to order. Um, this is the I'm just checking your time. I welcome all of you. I believe uh, that our so staff has advised me of your time limit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll call this meeting so, to um, order. Um, this is the I'm just checking your time. I believe that I so have everyone advised me of your time limit. I want to meet you to order. Um, this is the inequalities have meant that deaths and loss of livelihoods have been strongly driven by socioeconomic status, often compounded by gender and minority status. Attempting to save money by neglecting environmental protection, emergency preparedness, health systems, and social safety nets has proven to be a false economy and the bill is now being paid many times over. The world cannot afford repeated disasters on the scale of COVID-19, whether they are triggered by the next pandemic or from mounting environmental damage and clim climate change. Going back to normal is not good enough. In adversity, the crisis has also brought out some of the best in our societies, from solidarity amongst neighbors to the bravery of health and other key workers in facing down risks, risks to their own health to serve their communities, to countries working together to provide emergency relief or to research treatments and vaccines. The lockdown measures that have been necessary to control the spread of COVID-19 have slowed economic activity and disrupted lives. They have also given some glimpses of a possible brighter future. In some places, pollution levels have dropped to, to such an extent that people have breathed clean air or have seen blue skies and clean waters 
or have been able to walk and cycle safely with their children for the first times in their lives. The use of digital technology has accelerated new ways of working and connecting with each other, like us today, from reducing time spent commuting to more flexible ways of studying, to carrying out medical consultations remotely, to spending more time with our families. Opinion polls from around the world show that people want to protect the environment and preserve the positives that have emerged from this crisis as we recover. National governments are now committing trillions of dollars in a matter of weeks to maintain and eventually resuscitate economy activity. These investments are essential to safeguard people's livelihoods and therefore their health. But the allocation of these investments and the policy decisions that will guide both short and long-term recovery have, to put, have the potential to shape the way we live our lives, work and consume for years to come. Decisions made in the coming months can either lock in economic development patterns that will do permanent and escalating damage to the social systems that sustain all human health and livelihoods, or, if wisely taken, can promote a healthier, fairer, and greener world. Let me share with you some key elements that you may wish to consider in light of building back better the Philippine society in light of sustainable development that you have committed to. Therefore, could I please have the first slide, please? The second, please. So many countries actually want now to see their country that with a vision that all people enjoy healthy lives and well-being, living in a healthy, safe and supportive environment as members of an inclusive society. They want safe societies, they want supportive societies, and they want healthy environments. The next slide, please. So what are you know, the challenges that we face in health. So we see that longer lives do not equal healthier lives. We see rising non-communicable diseases, and I believe also in the Philippines, and you've worked with our regional office on, um, on a plan to address those. We see rising antimicrobial resistance. We see new communicable diseases such as COVID-19 now and inequalities of health outcomes. We see new infection, infectious diseases threats, and these highlight the weaknesses of our societies. And we see that climate can be even a bigger threat over time. At the same time, we have opportunities, whereas at least 50% of the global burden of disease is preventable also in the Philippines, but only less than 9% of healthcare spending is on prevention. And we see that inadequate investment in population-based prevention and health promotion. Could I have the next slide, please? And we see global transitions that impact our health and well-being. In demography, we see a growing and aging population. We see that 68% uh, of people living currently uh, living in cities by 2050. We see that climate change and energy use exacerbate health risks. Four million people, for instance, die annually from polluting households' energy sources. We see, and my colleague Dr. Branca will talk more about this, that globalization uh, uh, and, and industrialization of food supply foster double burden of undernutrition and obesity and diet-related non-communicable diseases. And we see an epidemiological transition that shows the shifts from disease burden to non-communicable diseases, increase of antimicrobial resistance and risk of zoonotic diseases, as I've outlined before. And finally, we see an increased use of internet, smartphones, artificial intelligence, 
that have either positive or negative impacts on our health and mental health. Could I have this next slide, please? So, therefore, it's important that we're aligning health with the other SDGs, the other Sustainable Development Goals. And Senator Cayetano, you're very much at the forefront in the Philippines of doing exactly that, that we're seeing the interconnectedness of the Sustainable Development Goals with health. You can see here just a couple of examples. I don't want to go into that, but you see how health is so much intertwined with the sustainable development agenda. The next slide, please. So therefore you could consider potential strategic ob objectives for the Philippines to scale up prevention and health promotion, to act on the determinants of health beyond the health sector, to strengthen and empower the health sector to lead, govern, coordinate and collaborate, to enhance evidence, define and prioritize research agendas, engage with multiple actors, create a social movement for health equity and healthier population, and finally, to measure the progress and results to guide attainment of the SDGs. And the next slide, please. You could think of approaches to achieving this country impact in the Philippines by convening and leading national discussions to shape the narrative on determinants of health and risk factors, by developing cost and equity effective solutions to address health risks and implement available norms, standards and guidelines inter alia coming from the World Health Organization and our tools to provide advice, technical support, and capacity building to your local communities, to strengthen governance mechanisms with cross-sectoral engagement, to leverage and engage relevant state and non-state actors, and to support the monitoring of outcomes and indicators and policies at all levels and evaluate the impact. And the next slide, please. And I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Kretsch. Um, are you able to stay and join us for a little more time, or what, what is your time constraints? You can, you can. Yes, okay. I, I can stay. I can stay for a couple of questions now, if you want. Uh, that I think was the original idea, but then yes. I would need to leave you. Okay. So. Um, let me then um, proceed to to just throw you a few questions. Um, would you say from, from from the presentation that you gave us, my, my takeaway there is that um, one is precisely the objective of this committee, that uh, the health sector works with other agencies precisely to um, create the programs and um, plans will really um, address various health concerns that go beyond immediate, maybe control or, or, or the normal um, agenda of the health sector. Is, is that correct? You didn't really elaborate on that, but you did. I think that was like the second or the third point, right? Is that, that's, a, that's what you were driving at. Can I be unmuted? Am I unmuted? Yes, go ahead. Yes, very good. Yeah, uh, Senator, uh, yes, exactly, that's it. Um, we see that um, health, is, health is created by and large outside of the health sector. We say that about 20% of health is created in, in hospitals and healthcare facilities. 80% is created outside. So the decisions that you take in the Philippines on the transport se sector, your energy sector, the way you're creating social safety nets, um, the way you're uh, driving your education, the way you're addressing gender uh, uh, imbalances. These are all factors. These are policy decisions that you can take that either create health or ill health. And I think it is in the interest of 
the health sector, but in the interest of the society overall, that the decisions that you're ta you take in those sectors take into consideration the potential positive or negative health impacts that these decisions would have. Yes. Um, may I know, um, other than this committee itself in the Philippines, the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, it is our, uh, uh, the government agencies, NEDA, the National Economic Development Authority, that is tasked to oversee the achievements, the targets of uh, the SDGs. Are there other mechanisms, clear mechanisms, that WHO has observed or recommends um, in other countries that make it easier to to create this inter this this you know to make it the norm for these agencies to coordinate because i feel like it's still a stretch like after this me after this meeting this hearing i'll come up with a committee report you know there might be there's there's one i, I don't know the extent that i i know you're familiar obviously with my work on um on uh, syntax and tobacco control and we had discussed also uh, the effect of um, uh, sugar in the diet, etc. But I'm also working now on, um, because of this SDG committee, on a sustainable city, sustainable transportation. So I have that angle where we will, we have been discussing in depth in that hearing on the impact of health, on the impact on health of unsustainable forms of transportation. But my point is, you know, it's like one at a time. Are, are there are there are there models out there that we can look at that really capture the effects of all these other, um, like you said, outside of the health sector, everything else that's happening outside that affects affects the health sector. For the last 30 years, uh, different experiences, how you can actually work across sector to have what we call a joined up government, um, where we look at what we call health in all policies, because we understand that these health impacts in these decisions outside that are taken outside of the health sector are so important for the development of health in the country. So therefore, yes, indeed, we have, um, uh, um, we have learned a couple of lessons. What are they? The first thing is that um, you need to engage with the communities. You need to bring communities together, the different stakeholders uh, that you have in communities and at national level. Um, in order to identify what the real needs of the society of the communities are. If you do that, you will have a likely better compliance with um, policy decisions that you're taking. Take the current crisis there now. Um, if you co-design the measures that you're taking during this crisis together with the stakeholders in the community, the likelihood of compliance is much higher than if you don't involve those communities. And that is true for the current crisis and for what we call peacetimes as well. The second thing is that you, and you rightly mentioned this, you need to uh, identify concrete plans with tangible measures. Um, and for these tangible measures, you need to identify your local um, indicators for success. They might be based on um, many other uh, indicators that we have that you can measure through the Sustainable Development Goals. They might be community-driven indicators that you want to identify and be accountable for uh, through the community engagement. Um, and um, then one important other area is what we call health literacy, that you know about uh, what makes you healthy and what sort of behavior would actually trigger um, um, uh, better health outcomes. And what are the unhealthy behaviors that in the end each individual needs to take, the choices, the decisions that each individual needs to take uh, at the end for him or herself. Right? So these are 
elements uh, that you may wish to consider when actually you're now creating, I understand, um, the health promotion institution in the Philippines and also um, the, um, the measures that you have identified to reduce the not burden of non-communicable diseases in your country. Just because I, I need to hear it from a professional, um, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a question, which the answer is very obvious, but I'd like, I'd like your, your response to be on record. Uh, when you speak of community engagement and stakeholders, um, we, we normally tend to think of adults, but to a large extent, we all know that it's easier to teach children new habits, you know, better practices. And the older you are, you know, you bring along all these other bad habits. And, and a lot of it is just bought from misinformation um, that we had from years and years ago. And as, as we have worked together on um, tobacco control, uh, we went through the... Um, um, the ads, the marketing materials that cigarette companies would use to actually claim that uh, cigarette smoking was actually healthy for you. Certain brands were actually recommended by doctors. Um, so on that note, you know, there, there, there easily could have been that generation that grew up choosing to believe that. On the other hand, um, I understand that in many countries, uh, like in, in uh, the UK, uh, where they have a very, um, they're, they're, they really have a declining uh, uh, incident of young people smoking. It's because there is nothing for these kids. There's nothing desirable about smoking for these kids, you know, because of all the interventions that have been put into place over the years. So my question is basically to hear it from a, an, an expert and a professional to say, like, how much of these community interventions or um, um, whether, whether they're, they're government-led or also, you know, we, we do like working with the NGOs, should be targeted at children, you know, helping them develop these practices or even helping them teach us. My, yeah, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, our evidence shows that um, engaging children uh, in um, health literacy uh, initiatives is extremely uh, effective, um, not only uh, bec because children do understand that there are things that are unhealthy for them, but also um, uh, as we see that the settings of our da daily lives, so where we spend where we, our time, where we um, are born, where we grow, where we thrive, these environments can be at the same time be made much healthier. So therefore we have um, a huge network of tens of thousands of schools around the world that um, have committed together with us to make the school environment more healthy. To your question with regard to smoking, this year's um, uh, World No Tobacco Day, we actually dedicated uh, because we've seen that the tobacco industry deliberately targets our children uh, from eight years onwards at times. And so therefore we have actually um, organized a campaign to better uh, understand the tactics of the tobacco industry for children. This was so successful that we had 2.7 billion people um, using our materials, watching uh, the videos and the campaign uh, that, we've, uh, that we've developed. And it shows that therefore children are very much engaged in today's uh, societies because they themselves see that they have an interest in having healthier, a healthier world. Can you share those materials with us? Uh, with great time. pleasure, yeah. Senator, with great pleasure. Um, you, we also, uh, we also, if I may just say for the, uh, you know, um, more adults amongst ourselves, uh, that we've developed um, um, a cessation tool to quit tobacco smoking, uh, because we've seen that during the COVID crisis now, uh, 400 million people uh, are actually taking concrete measures at the moment 
to quit smoking. And we all know that this is not an easy thing. Um, and we've also seen that national capacities have gone down to help people quit smoking during the COVID crisis. So therefore, we worked with uh, artificial intelligence people and, um, you know, the filmmakers of Avatar to create um, a, a person, an artificial intelligence person that can help you uh, individually tailored to your needs to quit smoking. So if there's smokers amongst ourselves here, there's ample opportunities now to quit. Thank you so much. Um, I, I failed to mention earlier when I when I started the hearing that um, for these kind of hearings where we look into the future of health, uh, I really like to have an interactive discussion among the local experts and the international experts. So if we have and even the government agencies, oh, by the way, I'd like to recognize the presence of Senator Amy Marcos, who's joining us today. Hi, Amy. Um, feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, I, I welcome the questions of our other uh, resource persons. Usually we're more structured in other hearings, but precisely this is the kind of hearing where we're trying to learn from each other. And it's very rare. Um, COVID has brought about um, opportunities that we did not have before. It was not very common to have, we did not do these kind of hearings at all. And um, virtual conferences were unheard of. So if there's anyone in the, um, in the group in, in the from the local experts, uh, government agencies who would like to ask a question, um, please do not hesitate to do so. Um, I scheduled this on a Thursday precisely so I don't have to rush to session. So um, yeah, just just um, I'll I'll check I'll be checking the chat or if I see you raise your hand. But I think we have more than one block, so I can't see the hand raising. But um, you can put a message in my ch in the chat if if you have the number of the secretary. Please go ahead. Anyway. Um, Dr. Kretz, there's there's no one yet who has raised their hand, and I'm good for that. Thank you so much. I know we can reach you, so I'm just going to thank you in advance, not just for today, but um, for for the materials and uh, the support that you're giving us. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, it's it's been a pleasure, but also let me congratulate you on uh, doing exactly what you do now, having uh, fora to for uh, exchange for um, learning together. That is exactly what we need across the world now in trying to build our societies better. You have an ample opportunity here. I hope that you can use it. And we stand ready at any time for you to help with, with whatever we can. Thank you so much, Senator, for Thank organizing you. this meeting. Before you go, I wanted to say that another takeaway we have from Thing you said was you know when you mentioned the materials that are available you know how not 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 the whole philippines we still have um a lot to do in terms of connectivity there's still a big part of our population who don't have access to the internet but then again there is a number who do have access especially on facebook and the like and so um what i have been trying to do is to post any and and any health related um, concerns that I feel people should still be aware of. For example, um, the uh, unplanned pregnancies. You know, I've, I've posted about that. Uh, I have posted about um, tobacco. I have posted about um, other, um, the need for people who, who are undergoing chemotherapy or dialysis for them to have access. So you reminded us that, again, um, during this time, where many people are either working from home, in fact, there are young people who are not in school, we might as well give them the kind of information that we want them to have. And, um, and any information that you can send our way on anything that is um, connected with this is very much appreciated. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. And also, um, our country office in the Philippines stands ready, as well as our regional office in Manila as well. Thank you. So let me now call on our next speaker, Dr. Francesco Branca. Um, Dr. Branca is the director of the Department of Protection uh, and Food Safety of the WHO. So uh, without further ado, um, we're very excited to hear you speak. Dr. Branca, please take the floor. 
Senator Cayetano, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I feel very privileged to be able to speak to the Filipino Senate today. Uh, unhealthy diet is the top risk factor for the global burden of disease. About 11 million deaths every year are accounted uh, by that. And in addition to that, we also need to um, to have the burden, to consider the burden of uh, maternal and child malnutrition, the burden of obesity, which uh, really uh, is uh, make it uh, a, a major uh, threat and, and challenge to the achievement of sustainable development goals. We live in a world where we still have over 600 million people living with food insecurity, 144 million children under five with stunting, and over 2 billion people with overweight and obesity. So fighting all forms of malnutrition is critical to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, the current uh, pandemic of COVID-19 will add and amplify the existing challenges uh, facing food systems, especially in vulnerable countries. The near breakdown of food supply chains in many developing countries and the sharp increase in people suffering from acute food insecurity as a result uh, of uh, the disruption of food system uh, show that food systems have been unprepared to face such an emergency. And, and let me quote you know, a number of uh, elements to, to explain why this happened. You know, the supply side, you know, from agriculture, fisheries, some borders were closed. Um, people weren't able to uh, go to their uh, place. Uh, farmers were, were, were ill. Uh, we had closure of fresh food markets, increased food losses and waste, and particularly this resulted in uh, inadequate access to fresh food. In the food environment, we've seen panic buying, particularly of... Uh, 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 shelf-stable foods, and therefore a more processed shelf-stable foods. Uh, we've seen suspension of school feeding programs and, you know, overall loss of jobs, less income, increased opportunity for purchases. What has been the impact on diet? Uh, on the one hand, in a bit, bit more home cooking, but then um, increased use of processed foods, uh, and uh, in some cases, the need to have and more home delivery, particularly for elderly people. Well, we've seen an impact on nutrition. We have seen an impact on food insecurity. There's been an, an estimate of over, over additional 135,000 people going into food insecurity. We have calculated that there will be an increase in child stunting, uh, and uh, you'll probably will increase by 700,000 for each percentage point of drop in countries' gross domestic product. And also, the number of wasted children will might increase by about 20%, which is 7.6 million. So really a very, very challenging uh, uh, situation. Um, overweight and obesity uh, was also associated to the pandemic. And uh, being overweight or obese can lead to serious health consequences, such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, and some cancers, as you well know. Um, but uh, obesity-induced preconditions are risk factors for affecting the severity of COVID-19. And, and so uh, people living with severe obesity may be suffering from multiple serious diseases. And, and of course, the fatality rate and the severity of COVID-19 has been much greater. So in this dire uh, picture, what could be the response? I mean, certainly uh, responses um, have, uh, have happened. Uh, and uh, I think many countries have been able to curb the negative consequences. But as Rudiger was also saying, you know, this is the, the opportunity to responses that might help us to build back better. And there's a very nice uh, um, uh, a brief policy brief produced by the Secretary General explaining how actually we can build better uh, the food system. Um, on the supply side, uh, uh, there's been action to a mitigate action to avoid turning really this serious health crisis into a major food crisis. I think we're still in time to curb some of those effects. Um, there's something we need, we can do to protect our food workers. Uh, together with FAO, WHO has developed guidance for food businesses to protect the food supply and the health of food workers along the food production chain. But we also need to reassure people that uh, uh, food uh, can be kept safe, you know, food uh, 
uh, doesn't transmit uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we've also issued guidance for competent authorities uh, responsible for national food safety control systems on how to optimize food control functions and prioritize critical services that preserve the integrity of food system. Uh, in the space of food environment, we have seen um, um, better ways to distribute food with shorter chains, but also uh, strengthening social support system with, with food baskets being provided to, um, to uh, families, particularly elderly people, including perishable and, pre and fresh food. So that's an opportunity to revise our way to look at uh, uh, social protection. On, on diet and health, WHO has basically uh, reiterated uh, the healthy diet recommendation. And let me remind them to, to you. And first of all, you know, healthy diet starts very early in life. So, uh, you know, breastfeed babies and, and young children. Um, but also in, in terms of our diet, uh, 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 diet uh, that should be varied. So eat a variety of foods. Eat less salt and sugars. Eat moderate amounts of fats and oils. Eat plenty of vegetables and fruit. Drink water every day and enjoy family meals. So a package of actions and policies that uh, uh, countries, governments uh, can take the responsibilities of. And of course, in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, actors in society, uh, particularly those who are responsible for the production and distribution of food. Uh, we are aware of the uh, decisive action that uh, the Filipino uh, um, uh, parliament and government have taken and uh, in a number of important uh, policy actions, uh, which we uh, would like to congratulate we, you with. Uh, and Senator Cayetano, we know how active you've been in this. So uh, the implementation of the taxation of sugar sweetened beverages um, uh, started in January uh, 2018 as part of the tax reform for acceleration and in inclusion law. Uh, we're congratulating um, with you uh, to for having established that you are you are in good company. There are about seven, 70 countries in the world who have established such um, uh, fiscal policies, and we look forward to the assessment of the changes in purchase and sales uh, that uh, you might be able to document. We are aware of uh, your active discussion over the um, elimination of trans fat. Uh, and uh, so we, we're looking forward really the, the bill on, on, on trans fat elimination following the administrative order uh, by the Department of Health. Uh, we would like to highlight this political commitment uh, in, by the Philippines in the second report, uh, in second global report uh, on trans fat elimination progress, which will be launched on, on the 9th uh, of September. So this is uh, really important to prevent uh, uh, heart disease. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy one because trans fat can be easily replaced by a healthier uh, fats. We also uh, would like to uh, congratulate for the 1,000 days bill that was endorsed by the president in December uh, 18. Uh, clearly, there are other actions that uh, might be taken, and WHO definitely recommends that uh, in addition to um, uh, fiscal policies, um, you also consider restrictions on uh, marketing food to children. And as you as you're aware, there's been a resolution of the WHO Regional Committee that Philippi the Philippines uh, uh, signed up to. So that's um, that's uh, certainly a starting point. Nutrition labeling, clear, easy to understand. Front of the pack nutrition labeling is. Uh, something that has been demonstrated to benefit uh, and to change uh, positively food consumption. And finally, public food procurements, so that uh, uh, you know, public uh, purchases of, of food can be in line of um, uh, dietary guidelines. I'd like to conclude by saying that in 2021, there will be a global food system summit, and we look forward working with you on uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of some of these policies so, so that uh, you know, they can really become um, the norm in, in all countries for um, the improvement uh, of the quality of diet worldwide. Thank you very much.
some follow-up questions? Okay. As I, my own experience, um, there was a, uh, a very severe um, hampering of the food chain, food supply in the first few days of the quarantine or lockdown. And um, in fact, at that point, because this is all new to us, you know, a lot of people, there were a lot of parts of courting and the like. But what I wanted to share with you is that um, since our country is used to dealing with disasters, you know, we have a lot of mitigation um, and, and um, um, programs in place. So it's always this, uh, this um, immediate um, it is both government and, and um, private sector driven uh, drive, food drives to, to the most needy. But this always tends to be, um, and I'll tell you what's in it, the most basic is rice, because we're a rice eating country. The most basic is rice, followed by sugar and coffee. If you're going to put three things in the pack, that's what it is. And I've always had a problem with that because, you know, if you, I'd rather obviously put some protein in there, some other things, but they said no, but people live with their costs. What it is. Um, but within a few days, when when things were clearing up and the um, truck loads of vegetables uh, were coming in from the provinces, you know, these are like anywhere from three to six hours away, seven hours even. Um, I personally uh, immediately wanted to start distributing vegetables vegetables and I, I encountered so much resistance from everywhere from number one that all oh, the supply is unreliable number two um, it's it's going to be very um, inefficient to deliver vegetables because they're fresh and you know they by the time that they get sorted and packed it won't be it won't, the quality won't be good but um, I persisted with this and now uh, we for for a good two months, we were delivering regularly to various areas, and that was the contribution that I made personally, which proved the point, you know, if you do, it can be done. And um, I'm not sure if we have here, I hope we do. Um, I had asked that the council of official back to the president, um, asking for the Nutrition Council to, to step and, and help people who want to help craft better, better food packages for people in need. So um, my reaction is basically, well, one is I wanted to share that with everybody who's here. And also, um, I take note of your comment, um, Dr. Branca, about taking note of the changes in purchase, because I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a spike also in the purchase of canned goods, because that is exactly what people were relying on during this time. Um, but my question now to you is, when you mentioned early on that through FAO, you know, there are programs um, uh, directed at supporting um, farm workers, people in the food industry, my question really is, if we look towards the future, um, what do we see about the future of food and the future of agriculture that we should be preparing for? Number one, because a big, big chunk of our population are in the agricultural business. They rely on this as their livelihood. But we know, and there are studies that tell us that in the next 20, 30, 50 years, the world the world cannot, we cannot sustain the production of food in the way we're used to. So the, you know, the, the production itself will suffer and how do people make this conversion and how do we assure that it is still healthy? For a country like ours that has a very, I mean, it, it's basically like an Asian diet, you know, which I know is very different from, from um, you know, American diet, um, maybe the European diet. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Branca? <laughs> Well, Senator Caetan, I mean, you are uh, giving a picture which uh, has been actually uh, seen by other countries as well. So, you know, the, the, the difficulty in, in ensuring uh, uh, 
uh, fresh food. But yeah, indeed, that has led to a re to a you know reconsideration of the way our food system is organized, and with, with the long value chains are difficult to. Uh, to to maintain and uh, uh, the resilience of the food system is not there. So in many countries, there actually been a rediscovery of the short value chain, which a better connection between particularly the urban areas and the rural areas, uh, with uh, you know new distribution system that have been established and 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 considered. So um, yeah, indeed, uh, not only this experience and and this ter this terrible reality of the pandemic, but uh, um, the, the consideration that food systems have actually failed to provide the, the right nutrients to all, you know, the inequalities, uh, inequalities are, 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 are enormous in, in the access to food uh, system. And we've, we've calculated in the last uh, state of food security report uh, that we've jointly published with, with FAO that uh, about half of the world population is unable to access uh, healthy diets, you know, 3 billion people. I mean that's that's actually not sustainable. So so we need to reconsider all that. We need to reconsider um, uh, food production systems. We need to uh, reconsider food distribution systems. But it has to come from both sides, from the supply side and the consumer side. So consumers' policies, consumers' demand will drive um, that change, uh, as well as the investment policies in agriculture and the food system. So I think you know that we need to use this multiple leverages to change what goes in our shops, in our tables, uh, and make it more aligned to, to, um, to healthy diets. That's why uh, the, the Food System Summit is a great opportunity. Uh, we're looking at that uh, with multiple actors, with the idea of uh, having food which is not only healthy, but sustainable for the planet uh, in, in, in view of the increase of the population, and, and then equitable. So, so these are variables that we need to consider. Thank you. Yes, because um, you're right. Um, we, I mean, as policymakers, you know, we may we may forget that um, it's consumer driven. Um, it's a business, and so if the consumers are not um, aware of or are not um, primed to look for these kind of foods, then uh, the supply end will just continue to to deliver on those kind of foods. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Brown. Well, and thank you very much, Senator Cayetano, for the opportunity to speak to you. And apologies, I will have to leave now, but I look forward to uh, interacting with you uh, on this important topic. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. So um, let me now call on our next speaker, and um, she is um, Dr. Regina Pasqua Berba. Um, she will speak on the future of infectious diseases in the Philippines. Dr. Pasqua Berba was formerly the head of the Infectious Control Unit of PGH with experience in health policy development, especially in poor, poor communities. So welcome, um, Dr. Berba, and uh, you have the floor. Is Dr. Berba here? If not, I'll call on someone else first. Um, okay, let me let me um, announce who are the next speaker. So uh, let's see who's available. Um, next, we have Dr. Tony Dance, and then followed by Dr. Joel Abanilla and Dr. Anthony Piano. So um, Tony, I think I'll give you the floor, the floor first since. Um, uh, Dr. Berba is not around yet. So Dr. Tony Dance will speak on the future of primary care. Um, Dr. Dance is a professor at the University of the Philippines and associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology in the U.S. Um, so Tony, please uh, go ahead and um, your presentation. Good, af good afternoon, Senator Pia and guests. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'd like Permission to share my slides, please. So are, are you able to see my... Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Mm.
I'm not being allowed to ano to share. Hmm. Um, see it there, now? Okay, it's, com it's coming. It looks like it's coming out. Mm. Yes, but it's very small, so I don't know how you... I think you can click on something to enlarge that. Um, there you go. Is that... Ah, uh, no. It's so Wait, small. It's just me. Hold on, hold on. Can the others see my slide, ba? Is it big enough? No, we cannot see your slides, Dr. Dan. Okay. There's like a... There you go. It says I'm sharing. <laughs> it there? also says I'm sharing, but there's nothing there. Let's see. Okay, I'll try it again. Is it because of the format? I'm directing this to my team and the secretariat. Is it because of the format that you can see all the guests? That's why his slide is just coming out. There's like a small, like a thumbprint size of his slide. Here it is. Try it again. Mm. No, what's actually appearing is like um like a gallery of the of the participants. Here is that showing? No, it's still the gallery of the participants. So mm. make just I know you can go with the next speaker, Senator Pia. I'll just send this to, to my Joe. team. Yeah, okay. so she can present it. Okay, so yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's do that. Thank All you. right. Let me call on somebody next. Um, is Dr. Burba in? Not yet. Sige. Can I ask the team to please contact her? Um, Dr. Joel Abanilla. I'm here. Dr. Abanilla. Yes. Yes. Hello. Welcome. So I'll give you the floor. Dr. Abanilla will speak on the future of cardiac diseases. Um, he's the executive director of the Philippine Heart Center. Uh, Thank you and welcome, Paul. Uh, just for a while, I'll call my technician. I will be putting in my slides also. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, three minutes. Okay. Let me just name the others so that they can be on standby. Dr. Anthony Piano of the um, Philippine Neurological Association and Dr. Robert Barha, and then Doc Professor Marie Diane Monsada. So yeah, let's just wait for a minute, a few minutes while the slides are being set up. Slides namin was not forwarded, it's with us. Eh. There it is. Okay. Oh. 
Kasi dalawa na skip wala, di, di mapalabas ang ano nila, slides. Uh, is that out? Uh, can you see the slides now? We're ready. Yes, we can see the slide now. So please proceed, Doctor. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, I will be uh, uh, shortly discussing in just a few minutes uh, focused on the uh, future of uh, cardiovascular diseases in the Philippines. This has been the changes as to the incidence of the various uh, uh, tap diseases in the country. Uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, of course, everybody knows, surge to the number one spot. And uh, there, that accounts for 69% increase from 1990 to 2017. Also, we can see also the surge of diabetes from number 12 to number four. So in cardiovascular diseases, it's uh, lump together uh, ischemic heart disease, those are patients having blocked in their coronary artery disease, and those having stroke and hypertension as well, or high blood pressure. When you go to the leading causes of death in the country, this is uh, circa 2017, the latest now, 2019, is very similar. Still occupying the number one spot is ischemic heart disease, but uh, number two now is occupied by cancer, and number three is uh, uh, cerebrovascular uh, diseases. So together, cardiovascular diseases death uh, or mortality rate accounts for about uh, 45% to 50% of total deaths. So for every one death of any other cause, one will be a cardiovascular death. To give you that figure, that is approximately about 150,000 deaths in one year. Approximately about 12,500 deaths in one month. Much, much more than COVID deaths, no? Uh, that's due to cardiovascular diseases. Now, the effects of this are self-explanatory, you know, because of the uh, uh, increase in the incidence of uh, cardiovascular diseases, we have increased death rates as well, and that also the quality of life of uh, affected patients, as well as the quality of life of their family is markedly or significantly affected. Uh, so it's a heavy toll you know, on the socioeconomics of the Filipinos. As to the changes you know, of the causes of cardiovascular disease, uh, if we go by the risk factors, the non-modifiable, that is the age, sex, you no know, uh, family history, nothing much changed. You know, uh, the past years and up to the present, except we are now seeing uh, more of uh, younger patients having heart attack or coronary artery disease. So they are developing, you see that trend, no? Cardiovascular disease earlier than the usual. As to the modifiable risk factors, such as smoking, alcohol, lack of exercise, um, this has also significantly increased in terms of its impact on the occurrence of cardiovascular disease. Okay, and uh, the, the, the uh, burden now uh, of this disease uh, uh, in the family is the loss of work and income as well, the cost you know, that can impoverish uh, a Filipino family. 
uh, the national level, the direct cost is uh, tremendous, no? Treatment, uh, their pensions, uh, uh, and the care, and the indirect cost of the illness is also uh, taking its toll. Hard to measure, but in fact, might even be more than the direct cost of the illness itself. This was a study uh, of a collaborative effort of the WHO, uh, the UN, uh, DP, and the Department of Health. They have made uh, calculations that it costed uh, the Philippines about uh, 756 billion uh, per year as a toll of this non uh, communicable diseases, but these are mostly made up of cardiovascular diseases. And that uh, is equivalent to almost like 4.8% of the uh, GDP in uh, uh, 2017. And if you are going to uh, consider you now the indirect costs such as absenteeism as well as the presentism, that might in fact, be more. And then uh, also one third of these cases are dying also prematurely. And this is also a big toll in terms of income of the country. Now, there have been identified uh, interventions, now, uh, true policies that uh, has been calculated uh, to be uh, cost effective. The investment that will be put in into these preventive aspects are very cost effective. Identified are the tobacco control, of course, Senator Pia has been uh, um, involved in the syntax uh, uh, law. And then uh, we have also uh, uh, alcohol control also covered by the syntax and then uh, the salt reduction package as well as awareness of the importance of exercise or physical uh, activity. Now, in terms of investment, if government were to put in money, they have calculated that the most cost effective will be uh, putting it in uh, uh, modification of the diet, such as reduction of salt you know, or sugar in the diet. Now that will be followed in terms of cost effectiveness by um, cessation of smoking. And after that is also with uh, enhancement of uh, physical activity. Now over and above uh, all those policies that we have, the interventions that were uh, made you know, and proposed uh, to change this pattern of cardiovascular diseases are as follows. Now, education, no doubt about its role, how uh, the public can modify by modification and being informed, being empowered, and also screening of the risk factors and correction and intervention at the earliest time possible. And then also the researches and early detection and intervention uh, which we need to invest on also will uh, take a positive toll uh, on these uh, risk factors. Now, in terms of uh, uh, So ed education so should cover no? also uh, individuals uh, in the urban poor community particularly, and then uh, counseling of the risk factor control are also very important tools, uh, especially like in the blood pressure control. And, and follow up of these parameters also should be uh, monitored, uh, including uh, uh, parameters such as blood pressure, uh, body mass index, as well as the blood chemistry. Uh, nag, nag, ano siya, tumigil ayaw ng... 
what happened. Okay. On here. Now, uh, research has uh, definitely a great role in the preventive aspect and especially those dealing with primary prevention no? uh, in supporting community-based studies, uh, supporting community-based studies on screening of risk factors, as well as the silent diseases, uh, such as uh, do, detecting them by echo, uh, doing echo in school children to detect uh, valvular heart disease. Now, uh, the trend really for the future is uh, lifestyle modification and uh, medicines uh, will be uh, targeted towards also uh, making sure that this modification happens. Now, there will be also emerging technologies right now, a lot of them, such as your uh, PCI, or uh, that is your coronary angiogram and angioplasty, the bulb uh, uh, intervention, the uh, transaortic uh, valvular insertion, and so on and so forth. And uh, coming in also are the uh, ablation therapy, gene therapy, and the uh, robotics. Now, we are now into robotics also uh, to uh, minimize intervention in surgery. Well, uh, despite these technical advances, we can still see that the uh, incidence of the disease keeps on uh, going higher. So it just tells us that uh, a lot remains to be uh, done. And that also um, we need also uh, maybe to educate also and involve our primary care physicians. Good Dr. Dance is uh, coming in next. No? not only the uh, specialists, because they are just uh, uh, conglomerating in the urban areas. And also, I would like to emphasize this uh, goal that uh, uh, ensure no, that the primary care physicians uh, prescribe also evidence-based uh, medications so that uh, we can also uh, have uh, both primary and uh, secondary uh, prevention. And uh, there are now therapies also for heart failure uh, and um, uh, medications such as pharmacogenetics uh, device. There's a lot of things going on, cell-based therapy and heart transplantation. We are also uh, considering that right now. And uh, that's the use of uh, drugs. Uh, um, also uh, identify patients that are most likely to respond and those who will be having an adverse reaction. Uh, we have also technical advances that uh, lead to lesser intervention or less invasive intervention. Uh, and they are now so easily and readily done and can be available in a lot of centers. And uh, in terms of health technology, I think this is one avenue where we can really improve a lot. Now, and one thing that we can do uh, is the development and the implementation or the creation of national CB disease registries, because this will be the baseline that we can see how to uh, monitor the effects of our work or our intervention. Now, there is another avenue of uh, artificial intelligence for the future. Now, uh, a lot of groups now going into this that can make uh, information available or even uh, uh, consultation available online. And there are now a lot of uh, apps in uh, the, even in the cell phones that can assist patients doing the exercise or even monitoring heart rates or blood pressure or even uh, the calories that has been uh, done. So in summary, no, we still have to focus on preventive cardiology. Uh, 
we have to address uh, behavioral risk factors. Also, we have to encourage our doctors to prescribe evidence-based uh, medications. And also, um, we have to support also the adaptation of the coming in of new technologies. Uh, and also, we have to adapt the healthcare to the uh, incoming technology, uh, particularly the use of big data uh, that I have mentioned that is uh, like the creation of a national cardiovascular registry. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doc. I, I'm just writing something. Give me 10 seconds. I might forget my notes. Okay. Well, um, when you mentioned the need for a cardiovascular registry, um, are you suggesting that we need a law for that, or is that something that within the society, within DOH, that you can do? Uh, this calls for budget. This uh, calls also for uh, uh, IT, and it is relatively expensive. Mm. We have been pushing for this, but it's the uh, limitations of budget that has been the obstacle. Well, if you can legislate something to enhance this, that will be a very welcome development. Uh, Madam Senator. Yes, um, Dr. Taya, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the recognition and good afternoon to, to Senator Amy Marcus. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, this is brought to our attention by the Philippine uh, Heart Center, their need for a registry. Uh, since last year, we want to work it out uh, this with them. Yes, it, uh, it involves uh, investment, but uh, our, my office, the Knowledge Management Information Technology Service, can actually work with the Philippine Heart Center Okay, so that uh, we can establish it uh, because of this demand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tayag, for that uh, intervention. So I'm sure uh, that's good news to um, all the, the cardiologists and uh, in the practice not to hear that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abanilia. I'll just make some quick uh, comments. So we have a lot of speakers, so I don't have, I won't, I'll save my questions maybe for future um, sessions or meeting. But just very quickly, I really appreciate the input you gave. You mentioned um, lifestyle modification, behavioral changes, and um, that's really the reason why I like to have these hearings with uh, multi-agencies and sectors avail around to hear it because um, if I go back to the first few resource persons, they also referred to that, and you're saying the same thing. No? So it's so important because you can only do so much on your end, no? and it's really important that we create that um, atmosphere. I don't know, Lang, if you have the data. NCC, uh, Dr. Taya, you're raising, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes, ma'am. I also want to share information to everyone mm -hmm. that uh, there was a publication uh, this is priorities um, two years ago, and it listed uh, interventions that should be prioritized for all conditions. And because there were studies that uh, listed these interventions as the most cost effective. Okay. In fact, we don't have to, to implement all interventions, so they have listed. And one of those, for example, is... Uh, aspirin okay and uh, the uh, the heart patient is the, and uh, there is a recommendation for example for uh, aspirin thank you okay thank you doc are, are you referring to um interventions due to uh, cardiovascular diseases or interventions for all sorts of um, conditions what were you referring to specifically? The list, the list that you're referring to for was that for cardiovascular alone? Uh, I think I, I'm aware of that list of intervention. Uh, and that's for cardiovascular. That, it's more yeah. for uh, this is for uh, diseases, uh, but but majority of it are cardiovascular diseases. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. 
Um, Doc, pasubmit na lang para if I if we can include that in a future discussion later on, I'll, I'll give you the floor at that. But if you can also give me a little list, thank you. Okay. Um. Anyway, uh, but going back to yes, my yes, ma'am, because this is important. So yes, yes, for sure. Thank you. So just going you, back. Um. So I mentioned yes. the lifestyle modification and behavioral changes that was that was pointed out. And then uh, the new technologies. So those are things that um, would be interesting for us because, um, again, as I always um, clarify, you know, my, my job is really the future. Um, we have our committee on health that deals with the now. So I'm really projecting into the future. But obviously, we can't jump into the future you know, without uh, dealing with where we are. But, but just to be clear that that is my focus. So um, when we talk about technologies, you know, it would also be interesting for all the other resource persons to also have an idea of like you know what what kind of technologies out there and maybe there there's material that you can submit and break it down for us for layman's terms so that we have an idea of what these costs are because um a lot a lot of our resource persons also come from pgh um practice in pgh and uh alam naman nyo paiyakan yan when we look at the budget no so for me it's very important that uh, lawmakers and decision makers are aware of how much these things cost so that we can start, you know, we, we, it becomes normal for us to to recognize that ganito talaga yan. No, hindi lang like we, we just hear of one, one, um, um, whatever, no, one, one uh, uh, type of equipment and then we have to close our eyes to everything else kasi wala, ta, wala kaming consciousness, no, na ganun pala talaga and that's what's being used all over the world na. So that would also help and so your your society or kayo mismo, um, doc, you can submit that naman to us. Um, yeah, I, I think I will leave it at that. I, I just because um, I'm also so much of a lifestyle advocate, no? um, I just wanted to share, and, and if you have any response to this. You know, when I travel to other countries, um, especially in, uh, uh, well, what's very vivid in my mind is um, Japan. And then uh, this is many, many years ago, decades ago, I was still uh, single and no kids. Uh, Korea, um, and then of course Europe. I notice how a lot of people in their senior years are very actively uh, moving around. No, I, I would encounter so many seniors on mountain tops in Korea and in Japan. And you know, parang I, I really feel this is so important for us to address because the tendency natin in the Philippines is, you know, when pagka pagka senior ka na, and when I say senior, I'm talking about the legal the legal definition of senior is 60. Um, I don't want to be misquoted, no, but we tend to baby ourselves when it comes to that. And yet here in other countries, they're like 75. They're hiking. No una pa sa akin, no. And I'm like, wow. I mean, it's just really a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And there's no there's no physical difference, I as far as I know, between the Koreans, the Japanese, and the Filipinos in terms of uh, of um, makeup. You know, we're born of the same material. Pero ganun ang upbringing nila, and they will also die that way. Hanggat kaya nilang umakyat ng bundok, literally umakyat ng bundok. It's not even as if um interestingly, this some of these mountains I've climbed. I'm thinking of a specific one in Japan, no. There is a cable car that brings you from the ground level to the first level, okay? So maraming turista na cable car doon. After that, there are like three or four more levels until the very peak where you can you can actually um, catch a glimpse of, of uh, a number of uh, known mountains in, in Japan. Anyway, up to the highest level, nandun yung mga seniors. So, and, and so I was wondering, um, and, and before I move on to the next speaker, do we actually have data? Uh, I know there's data. I've seen it myself. There's data that shows that that people who live a healthy lifestyle, including exercise into their older ages, are healthier, right? That data exists. But do we have data comparing Filipino seniors' lifestyle with seniors in even other Asian countries? If we don't, then can we commission such a study? Because I really, you know, want, I mean, those who are privileged you know, can go to the nice manicured golf courses ang sarap naman talaga no? and they work hard to deserve that my my father was a uh, loved playing golf on the weekends etc but i'm talking about the average filipino who doesn't have have a golf membership who can sana just just go up a mountain if may mountain near them or can uh, walk around wherever it is i i don't know that that is really an ingrained practice 
uh, with Filipinos. W would you have an answer to that, uh, Dr. Abanilla, or any, any, uh, anyone else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Pia, yes. this is Tony. Yeah, so we've actually done, we've done actually a multi-country study on that, uh, showing that when we graph our study, uh, the pure study was done in 32 countries, and it shows that physical inactivity is actually, uh, it depends on the income of the country. The richer the country is, the lower the physical activity in that country. Uh, and this is because there are intrinsic activities that lead to physical activity amongst the poor. For example, if they're farmers or fishermen, then they they have more physical activity throughout the day, in fact. And when we measure the joules of activity, they, their activity is uh, the level of Olympic athletes, uh, so very high. Uh, when it comes to middle and upper class uh, one of the major uh, issues coming out these days is that lifestyle, uh, and even for the poor, is not really a choice. It's an adaptation to the world built around. So, for example, in Metro Manila, for people in urban areas, lifestyle depends on access to open space and space that you can walk in. Uh, smoking depends on the price of tobacco, and so does alcohol. And eating fruits and vegetables depends on the price of fruits and vegetables. So in uh, the interventions are shifting from educating people to creating an environment that is conducive to healthy lifestyle so that it becomes the default. Uh, healthy lifestyle becomes the default rather than something we want to adapt uh, after you get older. That's true. That's true. I mean, when I, when I think about these uh, mountains I've climbed, um, I'm sure it's something that they, they truly enjoy. You know? It's something that they really, really look for. They don't look like pinipilit sila. They're, they're a group of um, you know, elderly people, and they're laughing, and they're having fun you know, with, their, with their friends and doing it. So it's really, it's really also because they invest, no? invest in creating that um, environment where, where they can do that. That's right. I, I'm not sure if Dr. Abanilla wanted to say something more. Were, were you... Um, Speaking, Dr. Banilla, or are, are we done? Uh, uh, I just uh, add Good. The doctor just came up with that comparison or comparative data. But then a lot of uh, basic information, sa demographics natin, kulang. Now, in fact, uh, it's a little sad that when we meet with our counterparts, meetings or international meetings no uh, our, our data is one thing so uh it's really time to to uh improve or come up with our own we, we are improving right now of course uh with the help of course of the uh, department of health no they can also assist us in uh, creating this uh, pool of data now in terms of exercise um Medyo sa, sa kultura din eh, no? Eh, yeah, you're very right that um, in other countries, they could see the elderly moving around and doing are involved in a lot of uh, physical activities. Whereas sa atin, they are more confined uh, at home, you know? Maybe uh, not moving around. So that is, again, another avenue that is, I think, just an extension or a reflection of what we lack. Yeah, yeah. And and um, anyway, let me end on this note. I want to give the floor to Dr. Tony. But I also realized, based on both of your inputs, that a lot of these um, seniors now who are engaged in active lifestyle, uh, they also had the benefit then of um, being active when they were younger. So they just carried it through. No? So my dad died at a young age, only 68. But... Um, he already had that active lifestyle. So he and his friends, and his friends are still alive, uh, yeah. nag-golf pa sila, pumunta pa sila sa gym, kasi nga, naumpisa nila when they were younger. They had that opportunity. Anyway, we will talk more about that later. I'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Tony Dance. Tony, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much, Dr. Banilla. So my slides visible now? Yes, okay. So I needed system permission kanina. So I'm going to present uh, some 
uh, strategies uh, and data on primary care. That really comes from a group, and I, I just want to make sure I cite them properly uh, from the Philippine Primary Care Studies, fu study funded by PhilHealth and the Department of Health in collaboration with UP, uh, the uh, people of uh, Samal Bataan, and uh, Bulusan Sorsogon, who contributed a lot to what we're discussing today. So I just quickly through part, three parts of my talk uh, on the future of primary care. Number one, what is primary care? Two, just a few slides on why we need it. And then three on the assigned topic, which is uh, a dream. Uh, what's the future of primary care? So this is, uh, for me, a figure of primary care that most people can understand. Uh, if primary care were an ocean, uh, it can be divided vertically into specialties like allergology, heart disease, cardiology, surgery, uh, gastrointestinal disease, etc. Uh, so vertically or horizontally into primary, secondary, and tertiary care. So primary care is like snorkelers. They swim shallow, but they can swim far. They have a broad scope. Uh, secondary care is made of specialists who can... Uh, swim deep, uh, but not as far. And tertiary care is when uh, these same specialists have to uh, render procedures in a special facility. So why do we need that? So this is the schematic diagram of uh, why we need primary care. Uh, in our uh, current system, which are now trying to revise, a patient gets lost in the healthcare system and, and uh, has to decide on their own. Do I go straight to a hospital facility or maybe specialist MUNA? Or do I just buy medications or have some lab tests before I go? And very few people know uh, what primary care is about. So primary care is about giving patient uh, a single entrance to the healthcare system. Uh, so the primary care provider uh, is the first contact of the patient and is able to provide comprehensive care. Uh, primary care providers are also coordinators for the service network. So they admit or refer when necessary and have the labs coordinate the conduct of uh, lab tests and uh, purchase of medications. And fourth, they're also the principal point of continuing care. So. This is the definition, four-point definition adopted in RA11223 or the Universal Healthcare Law. So uh, on to why do we need it? So this is just a summary of the evidence on primary care showing uh, health, it improves health outcomes. So strong evidence that it leads to a reduction when you invest in primary care uh, it leads to a reduction in all costs and cost-specific mortality. Strong evidence that continuity of care in primary care leads to a reduction in all cost mortality. Strong evidence that it leads to reductions in maternal, neonatal, and child mortality, especially in low middle-income countries. And strong evidence that they can have a positive impact uh, on measures of severity of depression, anxiety, and suicide. In terms of uh, health system efficiency, uh, there's strong evidence, evidence that continuity of care can reduce total hospitalizations. Uh, some evidence uh, that it's associated with a reduction in hospitalizations. Uh, strong evidence uh, that greater access to primary care leads to reductions in avoidable hospitalization. Some evidence that it can reduce hospital costs uh, strong evidence that it's linked uh, to increased emergency department use, which means access, and uh, some evidence that uh, there's improved access to primary care uh, can reduce total health healthcare costs. I'll skip that. So uh, the f uh, topic uh, Senator Pia asked me to talk about, I'll go that to that now, is the future of primary care in the country. And to attain this goal of universal health care, to fulfill these four functions of primary care, we, we think uh, there are four things we need to dream about. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on this one, the first one, which is 
the workforce. Um, this is uh, uh, from the WHO website on uh, sustainable development goals. No? Uh, and that the health-related SDGs will require a considerable healthcare workforce. And the recommended healthcare workforce is about 10 doctors per 10,000 population, 20 nurses, and 20 midwives, more or less, for every 10,000 population. Half of these 10 is to 10,000 physicians should be in primary care. So, sila yung unang pinipuntahan. Right now, the healthcare uh, physicians, uh, which is where I have more data on, uh, the, the national average is only 6 per 10,000 doctors. So, we're still a long way off from uh, the recommended ratio. And there is considerable va variability between regions. So if you look at these blue bars, these are the doctor ratios. So I said our target is 10, and it's only NCR that barely passes it, no? 10 per 10,000. If you look at uh, ARMM, they have less than one doctor for every 10,000. And this is between region. If you look between provinces and municipalities, it gets even worse. No? So our study that I cited at the start are both studies where in doctors, we have one doctor and 30,000 uh, 30, uh, citizens under their care. That's just the numeric ratio, but there's a true ratio, Senator Pia. Because uh, these doctors and uh, the nurses are asked to do a lot of administrative work. So actually, we need rural health physicians, but our municipal health officers do both administrative and clinical work half the time from our surveys. So the actual ratio of primary care physicians to actually take care of people is half of this. And this is the true state of affairs in our country. That even in NCR, well, NCR may be not so bad because we have a lot of private physicians, but uh, in Ilocos, you'll have only two per 10,000 instead of four if you subtract the time spent on administrative work. <coughs> Excuse me. The worst manifestation of this shortage to me is this lang at the bottom. 50% of deaths in the Philippines were unattended by a doctor or nurse or midwife. I'm sorry, this is not 2020. This is 2017. So half the people of the deaths in our country are unattended by any healthcare worker. So people wonder, ano ba yung alternative sources for primary care, no? I, these are our alternative sources, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Uh, and when things get really bad, we go to, to a hospital. And we are seeing this right now uh, in the COVID pandemic where people get a lot of their treatments and preventions and their actions based on what's in social media, which is very unreliable. And if not, they go straight to the hospital, which is now filling up uh, with even a good proportion of mild cases. So why do, what's the problem? Why is the workforce so small? These are two landmark studies by uh, renowned colleagues. No? Ebesate et al. showed, did a study on why healthcare workers stay. They stay to serve the country and to be with their family. Unfortunately, you cannot feed your family with nationalism. And so an, another as important study by Lorenzo et al., why do they leave? And the main reasons are underemployment. So they are paid much less than what they were trained uh, what they deserve from what they train. So they are contractuals or worse, even job hoarders. They are misemployed and are subjected to a phenomenon called deskilling, where they train for years to be nurses or doctors, and then they end up, uh, the nurses especially, end up becoming secretaries or even uh, operators in uh, wherever. No. Uh, and uh, the un their unjust working conditions, um, uh, the Magna Carta benefits are not uh, issued regularly. And this leads to a lot of unemployment. So what, what's the dream? This is our first dream, po. A personal primary care provider for every Filipino 
should be something we aspire for in the future. And there are many ways, many things that need to be done. Uh, we need to recruit a workforce with a minimum quantity with maximum quality uh, based on the WHO recommendations, provide scholarships for healthcare workers, recruit from indigenous populations, reorient healthcare profession education to promote careers in primary care. Uh, it's also important we need to recognize primary care as a specialty to give it the value that it deserves. That right now, the uh, only accepted primary care specialty is family medicine. And uh, the academy has uh, 7,000 members, but I was told this morning only 4,000 are active. So we really lack a lot of uh, primary care providers. So pediatricians, internists, and geriatricians can give ample support. And of course, nurses, midwives, and ito po, I, I italicize this and put this in red because this is a potential legislation where we can think of professionalizing our barangay health workers. They are, after, po, after all, po, uh, Senator Pia, they, they are the main bulk of our healthcare workforce. They are not trained and they are poorly paid. Uh, of course, I think we should also strongly recruit public health specialists to work side, uh, side by side with our primary care physicians so that they can be free to take care of the sick and maintain the health of the citizenry side by side with our partners in public health uh, who are more trained in uh, managing uh, or attending to administrative functions uh, in the barangay health units. And then we need to retain them. Uh, another issue for potential legislation is increasing the salary grade of healthcare workers. We, I think one thing we see in the COVID pandemic is the risk associated the work. And it's not, while we see it more now in the pandemic, this is actually something that happens every day. We see patients with tuberculosis, pneumonia, and many other infectious diseases. Uh, provide the Magna Carta benefits. And ito po, uh, matagal na pong uh, pinag-uusapan pero hindi ho umaandar. Possibly legislation, uh, an international treaty on healthcare worker recruitment. The unwritten strategy of countries like the US and the UK uh, is this. They have a problem with primary care. They don't know where to get the money for primary care. And guess what they do? They make us train primary care and then they recruit the people we train. So tatanim natin sila ang nagaani. And a treaty should impose some restriction on this uh, because it aggravates inequities. So perhaps we can uh, require them to pay for the training of any primary care providers that they recruit, uh, perhaps twofold so that it can make up for lost time. So quickly na lang to three other dreams, financing, our dream is sufficient funding for all primary care services. Uh, we think we should abandon this tedious process of registration. If you're Filipino, you should be eligible. Uh, registration is an obstacle to benefits, expensive, and gives a wrong incentive to the LGUs. All services should be covered, and instead of restricting the diseases we cover, we should restrict and put a cap per Filipino regardless of illness. Maybe add benefits for priority diseases, benefits for specialty care, of course, which is uh, uh, partners of primary care. Uh, in our study sites, po, we cover for transportation in remote areas. Some barangays are two hours away from the rural health unit. So we've devised uh, a validation system where the doctors can prescribe and till health can pay for transportation services by banka or tricycle. Uh, and this has really uh, led to an increase in consult consultations in our remote sites. Uh, also, uh, another dream, a uh, health information system, one patient, one record. Hindi yung pag pumunta ka sa hospital na to, iba yung record. Pag pumunta ka from one island to another, iba yung record. This requires records that are simple to use, interoperable, that automates many of the administrative tasks that take up their time. 
Uh, but we also need to rationalize the data we collect because our study shows that our barangays collect about three to five kilograms of data every month and they send it to the rural health unit which collects maybe 10 barangays uh, and it really takes a lot of time and effort for them uh, and then we also these records must connect not just the doctors but the nurses midwives and bhws so that there can be some task shifting hindi lahat nasa balikat po ng doctor uh, and then national connectivity was already cited if we have electronic records, wala akong gagawin yung data in isolated laptops or phones. Uh, they need to be transferable to other sites so that the benefits can be transferred, transferred and the aids. This will aid needs assessment, enable disease surveillance. So one of our main problems in the pandemic is our manual surveillance system or our semi-manual surveillance system, which leads to a lot of delays um and uh problems with data it's also a deterrent to corruption and enables PhilHealth and doh to control quality of care lastly po but still very important uh is yung engaging the community in uh moving to a primary strong primary care system so the dream is primary care workers endeared by the people so there should be correct messages that primary care it's not the lowest rung. Mababaho ang tingin ng mga tao sa primary care. GP lang tumingin sa akin or family med lang. Uh, mataas po ang tingin sa specialist. So we need to message that primary care is the foundation. It's not the lowest rung. So primary care physicians look at not just one part of you but the whole of you. Not too early but not too late and not too much. But just right. No? So, hindi sobra, hindi kulang ang matatanggap mo. Uh, and the media for doing this, the proper strategy would be community engagement in organizing primary care, town hall meetings. We've also developed video tarps and brochures uh, and tri media campaigns. We also need legislative and executive champions to push for primary care and enhance its image to the people. So summary lang, in summary, there we think there are four things that we must assure should happen in the future. We must assure, we must dream of a qualified, uh, a qualified personal primary care provider for every Filipino. And that mean, means entailing a sufficient number with sufficient funding for all services, including transport. Uh, lab and pharmacy in, uh, in remote areas especially, run using a one patient record system that communicates from Apari to Holo so that benefits are transferable, delivered by healthcare workers who are valued and endeared by the public. And not just by the public, they should be valued and endeared by their colleagues who are specialists and the government as well. So my last picture is this uh, the London Olympics opening ceremonies where they paraded the primary care nurses and doctors during the Olympics and tinanong sila kung bakit. Kasi sabi nila, they want, the UK wants to boast of their two contributions to mankind. One of them is children book, children's books. The other is primary care. And it shows how much they value primary care and so proud of their primary care team pinaparada pa sa Olympics, we need to change a system where primary care is considered the lowest rung in the ladder. So thank you very much, Fox, Senator Pia. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony. Um, well, you said a lot, and um, uh, since I have a lot of resource persons today, I will save my questions for some future discussion with you. Um, but I did want to ask a, a few things, no? Like in one of your slides where you talked about the, you, you gave some recommendations, no? On um, on a, number one is like a treaty of some sort. We can discuss that further because years ago when I chaired the committee on health, that was already something recommended, and I actually forwarded that recommendation and keep on talking about it that we enter into. Um, it doesn't even have to be a treaty because eh? usually the hiring authorities are either states uh, or directly the hospital. So um, it could be more of a policy that we have 
uh, among our within our own like with the um the the recruiters uh the the universities that that um that produce the nurses um you know because at the end of the day it benefits them if they'll get a payback eh? so i mean long story but um i i definitely am on that and i i want to work on that further and then uh, i wanted to ask if you can just submit to us very specific targets on the number of health workers we need i mean you had a number there like four thousand, but um i wasn't sure if that's the actual primary care doctor or if you have further breakdowns on the nurses and I'm also an advocate for nurse assistants. Um, we don't even have that in our plantilla, as far as I know. And then uh, in one of our hearings, what also came out was a, I forgot the actual name, but it's like a patient advocate, like the the person who helps. Because say you mentioned in the early part of your presentation that the, pa the, the patient gets lost in the system. And I can understand that. Now, my father had liver cancer and you know, we're all college graduates, my mom, and yet it's very complicated, especially when you're very emotional about a loved one being sick. No, So can you imagine all of us siblings were college graduates with postgraduate degrees and yet lost pa rin kami in the system. So what more pa for, for other, you know, countrymen of ours who are not even used to dealing with any kind of doctor. Anyway, so I'm also looking at that position, yung parang patient advocate, not to be part of that whole picture. So we can have further discussions of this later on. I just wanted to put it out there that um, those are my immediate reactions. But um, as you know, I, I, li I like having this discussion. So we'll park that for another time so I can put on record the other, other resource persons. Thank you, Senator P. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So... Um, Sorry, Tony, are you still there or did you go? Can I ask you? I, I, I remember I had one more question. Pala. I'm sorry. Are you still there, yeah. Tony? Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. This was another question. I had a note here. Um, you also mentioned, like, why don't instead, you know, given budgetary concerns, put a cap on the amount that each Philippine, we can spend on each Filipino, right? Okay. So that's a little bit of a different take, no? Because right now, what we have is the um, case rate, right? May I just know, and if there's anyone else here who'd like to chime in on it, because I understand um, that the, the Senate had a hearing on field health, and then the House also had a hearing. And um, somebody put forward the uh, recommendation to abolish the case rate. Now, I handled um, the creation of the Universal Health Care Law Act, the one before this one. So this was when I was chair um, almost a decade ago. And I remember that was the biggest accomplishment of that time because it would help hospitals um, at least be assured of this amount. No, and I I know that that amount is determined um, based on on an average. No, so some if you're a private hospital and your expenses are very high, then you might actually be paying a little bit more. Some surgeries get complicated; it costs a little more. But on the average, that is the amount. So by and large, I just wanted your opinion, Doc Tony, and then later on any any other. Yeah. Um, um, any other other doctor here who's involved yeah. in that? Is that still the position that case so, rate is the best way so far? Well, to deal so just with quickly, this? Senator Pia, just quickly, the I think we can't do away with case rates for hospitalized patients because we can't pay for everything. Yes. Uh, for but for outpatient care, uh, recognizing that the role of the primary care physician is to triage and to uh, give comprehensive care, uh, we need to have a different approach. Kasi ang pumupunta po sa primary care, may sakit ng ulo. And it could be anything. Or may ubo, which could be anything. So if you say you'll pay for TB, how do you get to pay for TB? Kasi they come to us with cough, and then you'll treat them with antibiotics for a week, and they don't get well, and a month later they still have cough, then you get an X-ray, and then you see there's TB. So uh, you're the one processing the undifferentiated symptoms. So we feel that for primary care, perhaps uh, we, we should have a different approach. Maybe primary care can be a single case rate for the year, no? it, it, a quote unquote case rate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and like I said, we'll discuss it further next time. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's move on. Um, 
Our next speaker would be uh, Dr. Anthony Piano, who's a governor of the Philippine Neurological Association, and this is uh, on the future of neurological diseases. Dr. Uh, Piano. Good afternoon, uh, Senator. Uh, Hello, good afternoon. Just, good afternoon, ma'am. I'll just be sharing my slides, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. I can't share my slides yet because Dr. Dance is still on sharing his application. Can the secretariat over uh, know that, override that? Actually, it's not shared. So I'm sorry, it's, sir. It's okay. just viewing Antonio Dance there. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Did it stop? Yeah. Ah, okay. It stopped. It stopped. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Get a uh, doc piano is your nickname also Tony? Uh, Ma'am, Tonyo po. <laughs> Sorry, Tonyo? Tonyo, Ma'am. Okay. My nickname is Tonyo, Ma'am. Is it sharing already? Are... Yes, Ma'am. Just curious. Uh, is my slide sharing already, Ma'am? Yes, it's sharing. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. Um, so I'm delivering this in behalf of the Philippine Neurological Association, and we wish to thank the Senate Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation, and future thinking, ably led by the Honorable Secretary Pia Caetano. Um, so here are the questions and discussion points that uh, that was forwarded to our association for which this presentation will cover. So kindly allow me to give an overview on neurological diseases in the Philippines. Now, neurological disorders encompass organic disease that affects the brain, spinal cord, nerves, and muscles. Examples are stroke, epilepsy, and Parkinson's disease. This is in contrast to mental disorders, which are often referred to as psychological or psychiatric disorders. Despite being distinct from one another, they are related and often overlap. Now, these are the general classification of neurological disorders broken down into general categories. Now, the Philippine data in neurological disorders are limited and often confined to single institution cases. The Philippine Neurological Association has collated cases among all the training institutions in the Philippines from 2017 to 2019. Um, the following slides are the available information that we were that we were able to gather. Now, from the Philippine Statistics Authority, they report that cerebrovascular disease or stroke is the third leading cause of death in the Philippines in 2017. It is second among men and fourth among women. Now, the 8th National Nutritional Survey includes two items related to neurological disorders, namely stroke, with a prevalence of 1.4 and Parkinson's disease at 0.6. Now, this slide shows the number of stroke cases among training institutions in Metro Manila in 2011. In the, uh, in the Philippine Neurological Association disease database among adults, the top five most common diseases are stroke, epilepsy, tumors, headache, and neurodegenerative disorders. These are the breakdown of the different uh, categories for uh, tumors, headaches, and neurodegenerative diseases. Among pediatric neurological cases, the leading cause are epilepsy, brain and spine infections, and congenital anomalies. A study done locally among children who had neurologic infections show that many will have debilitating sequelae as a move, as, uh, such as movement problems and cognitive disabilities. Now looking into the evolution in cause and effect in neurological diseases, the, world, uh, the projection of the World Health Organization on the causes of death uh, 15 years from now. Uh, by 2045, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders will be among the top 10 cause of death. Stroke will remain to be an important health burden now and in the future. Here are the modifiable risk factors in stroke that might be that may be targeted for prevention. They include hypertension, diabetes, heart conditions, smoking sensation, uh, snoring or obstructive sleep apnea, stress, and increase in alcohol intake. Among the non-modifiable risk factors, age will be an important factor we need to look at. The world population is aging. 
and it is expected that by 2050, Asia will have the most number of individuals above the age of 60. The Philippines is expected to have 22,595,700 individuals above the age of 60 in the year 2045. Age will be a risk, important risk factor not only for stroke, but likewise among neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. As a matter of fact, Parkinson's disease is projected to be the next pandemic because of the aging population and advances in healthcare. Now, I think the ultimate question is how do we adapt to these emerging global burden? We believe that before we plan for future innovations, uh, at pace with global standards, we need to play catch up. In terms of current capacity, we have available neurological service in, ter in tertiary hospitals. We have available imaging capacities such as CT scans, MRI, and PET scans. There are limited genetic testing capacities for neurological diseases, and we have 11 adult neurology and three pediatric neurology training programs in the country. To catch up and plan for the future, there is a need to establish reliable data on the epidemiology of the neurological diseases in the Philippines, from which will be the foundation to do relevant basic science, preventive uh, disease strategies, and technological research, and I'll translate all of this into clinical practice. At present, we have the Philippine Heart Center, the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, and the Lung Center. The PNA believes that we need to establish a dedicated institution for the neurological needs of the Filipinos in the coming century. We hope that the country will have a Philippine Brain Center that will provide general and specialized neurological care for every Filipino, a center that will pioneer in neuroscience research and a home to advance diagnostic capabilities at par with the world. The Philippine Brain Center can be the manpower resource to provide neurologists in all hospitals and healthcare facilities in the Philippines to reach every Juan and Nena in the country. Within its confines, we aspire to the establishment of a national teleneurology program. With a teleneurology program, we can implement a telestroke program, which needs to be backed up by a national stroke policy that will ensure implementation, availability of the clot buster medication, RTPA, and the capacity to give this medication remotely, among others. As we often say, time is brain and every second counts. We also hope for a national electronic health record system in the country that will be hinged on the national ID system. This will allow for easier data gathering and seamless transition of healthcare. Together with the National Electronic Health Record System, we advocate for a national electronic prescription policy. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the PNA had taken the challenge to request the DOH, PDEA, and FDA to allow digital copies of prescriptions for patients. We believe in collaborative work, especially with the Philippine Genome Center. Recently, a new drug, Zolgensma, has been approved to be the first gene therapy for treating spinal muscle atrophy. We hope that we can find a gene therapy for X-linked dystonia Parkinsonism of Panay, a hereditary degenerative disease endemic only to the Philippines. Technological advancements include neural implants that are indicated in different neurological and psychiatric disorders. It is available in the country, but the future will be refinement and development of this technology in the future. An example of evolution of neural implants is the WAND, or your wireless artifact-free neuromodulation device for the treatment of seizures. This is currently under investigation and we will see its use in the next five to 10 years. Other advancements include high-frequency ultrasound. This technology was approved for essential tremors late 2018 and early 2019. Other indications are currently under investigation and its applicability is not confined only to neurological disorders, but for other diseases as well, such as cancer. Finally, we also believe in, uh, that the future will be on cell-based therapy. This will be another avenue that we need to look into. Stem cells are currently under investigation for neurodegenerative disorders and even stroke. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Piano. Um, my request na lang would be if you're if it's possible for you to somehow prioritize among the requests so that we yes, have uh, you know like there are always things that can be done like for example the telemedicine part um do you actually need the brain center to be established already for you to do that parang hindi naman siguro, di ba? so parang, parang if it were a wish list you know what would be the urgent interventions we need and then 
you know, by way of timeline, um, you know, like if you have a 10 year plan, how would you do it then? Because I'm going to ask, by the way, all, all um, uh, areas of specialization to give me something like that. Thank you yes, so much. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. So now let me call on uh, Dr. Regina Pasqua Berba um, on the future of infectious diseases. She is a infectious disease specialist from PGH. Dr. Berba around or did we lose her? Uh, should I proceed with somebody else? Um, let's let's go now to Professor Marie Diane Monsada uh, on Filipino behavior on health. So Dr. Monsada is a senior lecturer in the Department of Behavioral Science in the University of the Philippines. Um, Ma'am, are you ready? Uh, thank you, Madam Senator. Please proceed. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Madam Senator. Uh, I am presenting uh, the Filipino Health and Behavior, a Behavioral Sciences Perspective from the perspective of the Behavioral Sciences. The talks earlier by our international experts actually mentioned of community needs and community involvement. Filipinos are very communal, not mentioning that we are actually social beings. And as part of our means of survival, we engage in social relationships. However, with this pandemic comes social distancing, as we always hear from our uh, experts, and the call that transmission of disease or illness can stem from one single infected person. For this afternoon, I will be discussing Filipino health and behavior, again, from the behavioral sciences perspective. We all know that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, uh, a study conducted entitled A Population Level Analysis of Mental Health and Non-Communicable Diseases in the Philippines Using Predictive Modeling Analysis by Gregory Samonte, Teresa de Guzman, and Rolando Gonzalez actually presented strong relationship between physical illness such as diabetes and mental health. Now, we are looking at uh, illnesses that we actually know now let's think about this kind of uh, illness that we have now, this pandemic. And it presents to us a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. And this is something that all of us were, were actually presented with na hindi tayo prepared. Now we ask ourselves how we are dealing with this health now. Now that we talk of hand washing, wearing masks and other protective gears, and even social distancing, which later I would highlight to be more correct when we term it to be physical distancing. We used to see the approach to diseases and illnesses as the bio biomedical model. We see disease and illness as explained on the basis of aberrant somatic processes. Of course, we see chemical imbalances, systematic malfunctions, and of course, treatment would go about drug therapy, vaccination, surgery. But then we have actually transformed in looking at health in looking at disease and illnesses using the biopsychosocial model with the biological aspect of course we see predispositions in the individual we look at uh, the illnesses or the the basic biomedical model that we used to know however we might also want to look at the psychological aspect of it we've mentioned that health uh, a part of health is actually mental health 
it also involves emotional health and it actually involves also beliefs and expectations. On the sociological aspect, here we see relationships. Now, this is something that's going to be challenging because we have been highlighting physical and social distancing, yet we highlight that part of understanding health is involving social support systems. Now, another perspective in looking at uh, behavior of uh, humans when it comes to health is the socio-ecological model of risk behaviors. Here we see that the individual is at the core, of course, surrounded by its social network, the environmental, the community involving the cultural values and norms, and of course, the policy. Sometimes we think that it's the individual alone or it's the policy that would govern individual behavior. But when we think of it, it's like, it's like a ripple that we make. Changes in the individual may actually progress to changes in a larger scale, interpersonal, organizational, community, and policy. In the same way that availability of these resources, as mentioned earlier, when we change our environment, when we change lifestyle, then we can actually also change individual. So yung tinutukoy natin kanina that uh, magkakaroon tayo ng lifestyle changes may actually stem forth and can be understood using this framework. Further, if I proceed to the social determinants of health and behavior, we can also see this uh, illustration showing that the social and community networks actually surround the individual. Hindi lang tayo dependent kung ano yung meron, pero posibleng dahil sa kung ano yung meron na tayo bilang individual, doon nagbabago yung ating social and community networks. Now, if we look at and understanding the pandemic, we think it's only, it's only a health issue. When come to think of it, it involves other sectors. It's definitely a multi-sectoral uh, concern and issue. And when we think of addressing the future of health and behavior with regards to the Filipino psychology, I think we need to consider this. When we understand the individual, we actually look at the affect, behavior, and cognition. By affect, we know that this is our emotions, these are our feelings. By behavior, of course, these are our actions, these are our words. By cognition, these are the way we think. These are our mental processes. But this is a Western framework. It was proposed that we can actually see this as something like this, the Filipino psyche. That the affect is actually our pakiramdam. The cognition is actually our diwa and isip. Our behavior is actually our salita and gawa. That if we look at it uh, on a later set of slides, it's actually about the relevance to the individual. We ask, why are some individuals, say, reluctant to see, as previously mentioned, uh, primary care? Maybe because it's not in their diwa. Nararamdaman naman nila. Meron naman silang nararamdaman na, na sakit. Pero baka hindi yun nag-sink in, as we call it, doon sa kanilang diwa. Ito, we have actually a perspective on proxemics that hindi bago sa atin ang social distancing. In fact, if you look at the Western concept of space, uh, we see that they have this uh, uh, concept of space that if we, if we fall in line in, in a restaurant and we have uh, foreigners around us, Sometimes they feel like we're, we are um, taking up their space. But for us Filipinos, how come the space is not so much of an issue? Probably because the way we, we are situated in terms of, say, our housing or our houses. There are certain houses that um, in, for our low SES communities, isang bahay nila is actually divided into several rooms, divided by curtains. Buti kung may kurtina pa. So yung concepto ng ating personal space or proxemics is very much different. This is what I was referring to. If you look at houses, they are clumped together. In fact, a house can be composed of several relatives, and these relatives may be shifting in terms of the way they sleep. So when we think about how people would go out saying that they are not, they are pasaway because they go out, probably because someone else will have to sleep and they have nowhere to go to. And if you look at another, then probably we can understand that Filipino psyche is not just about the individual alone. It's about the combination of the psyches of Filipinos that will come out, for example, and be observed in our cultural and social practices. And what are these? We have pagmamano, we have beso-beso, chismisan, umpukan, tagayan, tambayan, sabong, tong eats, pagsisimba or pagsasamba. If you look at, um, say, health, uh, one of the one of the common practices of Filipinos when they are sick is 
bahala na ang Diyos. O bahala na, the bahala na phenomenon. Na later, I will show you that this also, you know, ubo lang yan, sipon lang yan. Maaaring tingnan natin ito sa konsepto ng kapwa. Now, I'm speaking in terms of the psychological aspect of uh, understanding uh, health behavior. But the question is, sino ang aking kapwa? When we translate kapwa, this is actually our fellow humans. We think that anyone could be our fellow humans. But in the concept of the Filipino psychology, kapwa is someone who you find sharing of your identities. Now, the question is, us Filipinos being collectivistic, us having this very complex kinship system and relations, and as, an, as a natural human being who desire social support systems, marami tayong nag evolve na salita dun sa kay. May karamay, kaagapay, katuwang, kabagang, kapamilya, kapuso, kapatid, kaibigan, kapit-bisig, kapit-bahay. But we forget, forget one thing. There's what we call kaaway. And when we think of health, ang kaaway natin is actually the illness. Unfortunately, the illnesses that we have and we know, fine, we, we know, say, pneumonia, we know tuberculosis, we know measles, they have vaccines for it. But then with, with pandemics, with, say, onset of new illnesses, with onset of new epidemia, the idea is these are unknown. Ang kaaway natin, hindi natin nakikita. Kaya ang tanong palagi is, thinking about the behavior science perspective of it, then how we how would we address if certain instances would confront us of the unknown health issues? This is something that we all know. It's a universal sign. It says, of course, we understand there's no crossing. It evolved into what? Walang tawiran nakakamatay. It tried to instill fear, no? So that people will follow. In the same way that cigarette packs all, all, already had packaging na na medyo gross para hindi nila itaken dahil lalabas yung yung pangit yung pituha natin yung yung uh, baga natin hindi pa natapos dahil may mga pasaway pa rin na tumatawid or as we call them pasaway nilagyan pa natin ang bawal tumawid may namatay na dito and then hindi pa rin natapos sorry no advertisement uh, intended meron pang see you soon na para bang ano ba mamamatay kayo pag hindi niyo to ginawa now, I'm sharing this because there are certain, one of the problems in dealing with health and intervention and how people would actually adhere to health practices has a lot to do with bakit hindi nila to sinusunod, bakit hindi to relevant sa kanila. If you look at poverty, this is from one of our studies, uh, looking at uh, the definitions of poverty, we found one semantic meaning to them. It says, laki sila sa hirap. So, how do we go about poverty? They say, wala eh, sanay na kami sa hirap, dito na kami lumaki. So parang it's 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 similar to the concept of, ah wala, nagkasakit ako, baka, baka talagang panahon ko na. Baka naman it's meant to be, baka naman parusa to sa akin. Question is, why do they have that thinking? Now, Filipinos tend to put off their health concerns because of personal, social, economic, structural, and environmental reasons. You've seen that in the framework earlier. Now, despite their knowledge that they are susceptible to the disease and is a grave threat to their health, note, they know. With the, with the, with the vast of information on the social media, on mainstream media, information campaign is there. Of course, there would be an issue on which information is correct and not, and the misinformation. But information is there. The question is why? We always say, ayaw makaabala. You know, when we do contact tracing, diba, parang some people don't declare that they're actually, you know, having the symptoms. Kasi ayaw nila makaabala. Probably another is ayaw nilang madiscriminate. Or sipon lang to, ubo lang to. So, I think one of the things that we need to highlight is that we need to remember that even if I am, or this is my health, health is actually public health. And I think we can use the concept of kapwa for this aspect that ang kapwa ko ay ang aking fellow human pag nagkasakit ako, maaaring mahawa siya. So, hindi ko lang dapat inaalagaan yung sakit ko dahil akin to, kung hindi dahil pwede naming maging kalusugan or sakit to. Kaya ang, ang aking call is itaas ang kamulatan ng bawat Pilipino tungo sa kanyang diwa upang maiayon sa pag-iisip at damdamin 
para ito'y kanyang maisalita at maisagawa. Specific uh, steps is behavior change. Now, this is adapted from uh, a site that I found on primary health care uh, by uh, in Toronto, Ontario. And then I found it relevant kasi parang ito naman talaga eh, paulit-ulit naman natin itong naririnig. Pero I think, not just for the pandemic and coronavirus, but also for the future. I heard earlier our speakers also mentioned change in lifestyle. I think one of the basic lifestyle changes would be the, these three things, the specific ones. Hand washing and proper hygiene, wearing masks, and physical distancing. I'm highlighting physical distancing and not social distancing. So how do we do this? There were mentions of mobilizing existing health structures. We have them already. Now, the thing is, balikan natin yung konsepto ng kapwa. Sila yung kakilala kasi sila yung taga doon. Then maybe if we if we um, train them further, provide them with means, provide them with resources, then maybe we can uh, strengthen these existing health structures. We provide provide intensive health promotion. Now in the psychology aspect, ito na yung tinutukoy nating conditioning. Yung when we bombard them with information using the platforms that are already available, social media. There was a mention by Madam uh, Madam Chair that children are could be one of the one of the target population with regards to uh, promoting health. And for children, you know, when I have my kids watch uh, uh, videos and then they see, you know, hand washing, I I showed them the songs. They were singing and then they they were actually doing it. When you do it repeatedly, it's about conditioning. When we bombard them, it has to be constant and consistent. Tuloy-tuloy, para palang mag-echo na lang yun sa kanila, magiging natural na lang yun sa kanila. Remember, anong kalaban natin? Habit. Hindi natin naging habit yun. Strengthening community-based healthcare system, I've mentioned earlier, kakilala and capacitating the community. Sometimes we think that the community won't be able to do it, that it's always, you know, tagalabas or halimbawa the 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 out an outsider say an NGO it's good you know it's good but it, we always remember that the community might actually have their own resources we tap them so that when we leave them after the intervention they can do it on them on their own they can do it by themselves minsan kasi ang natapansin ko sa ibang mga researches namin when we look at uh, projects tinadala ng tagalabas pero pagkatapos noon aalis na yung nag-introduce ng project Wala na, kasi hindi na relevant sa mga tagaloob eh. Pero if you make it relevant for them, if you make it their own, if it make if you make it their project, then maybe it can be something that they can sustain. Yun yung tinutukoy natin na sustainability eh. We fail to see that it's a ground thing. All of course, we need to laymanize. Here I ask my my relatives, no? Laymanize and the use of local language. So di magdikit-dikit, di magsikit-sikit. When we use the, when we want to advocate for health uh, awareness and promotion, let's try to translate it in the local language, no matter how taxing it is. But the translation is effective. Why? They know it's their own. It's not, you know, it's not at Tagalog lang yan, or sa mayayaman lang yan. Lingwahe nila yon. So yado yado anay sa usat usa from Romblon. Yung di magdikit dikit di magsikit sikit from from the Cebuano language. Man arawian kayon la ng piano ag kayo man sakit. Sorry, I can't really pronounce it, but it's Pangasinense. See, when we contextualize it, they have a meaning to it. Like, you know, when we, when we, for example, ito, we already have the available um, universal language. Language is important. Eh. Language is a means to get through the psyche of the communities. Now, example this, we have the rainfall advisories, no? red, orange, yellow. For example lang, for example, we use, thinking about the ECQ, can't ECQ be the red? Can't the uh, MECQ be the orange? Can't the GCQ be the yellow? Meaning to say, we're already using uh, available and set language. Here, we're using color. So when people see it's red, oh, it's something that I should be alarmed. It's a no. no? If it's if it's something na, na orange, parang, ah, pwede pa. Pero sino kaya? So they will have an effort for it. Because it's there already. This is something that I, I actually laughed. Pero 
thinking about this presentation, it made me realize language actually matters a lot. Kasi here, oh, if you look at uh, community quarantine, my virus, enhanced community quarantine, my virus pa rin. Modified enhanced community quarantine, yes, my virus pa rin. Hanggang sa wag makulit, my virus pa talaga. To highlight, ano ba yung gravity nung gusto nating sabihin? The most that we can do is translate it so that we can make it local and we can make it applicable for them. And of course, lastly, there would be the conscious awareness of and being mindful of our habits and practices which are actually embedded in existing cultural practices. So tulad na mga nabanggit ko, halimbawa tong pagmamano, beso-beso, chismisan, when we think of promoting uh, health, let's think about ano yung meron yung komunidad na yon, anong meron yung kultura na yon, bakit hindi nila masunod? Maybe it is in conflict with their existing cultural practices or yung nakagawian nila. Then we try to match it. So it becomes relevant for them. Hindi natin totally eradicate. Maybe we can, if it's totally against health prevention, then we do slowly try to, we try to go inside their cultural system. There is something about the system why they cannot uh, adapt, why they cannot deal with health promotion practices. So once again, itaas ang kamulatan ng bawat Pilipino. Papaano tungo sa kanyang diwa, making it relevant for them? Upang maiayon sa pag-iisip at damdamin, they have the information. We just make it relevant for them para isalita at isagawa nila. Kasi pag ang isang tao ganagawa nila yon, yung kapwa sa paligid niya, kaya nang sundin yon. Then it becomes a community effort. It becomes reflected on the national level. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Monsada. That was very, very interesting. And I have questions, but um, in the interest lang of time, uh, maybe we'll, we'll uh, postpone it for another um, another hearing or meeting. But um, rest assured that your message is uh, well taken. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let's try again to to call on the line. Um, Dr. Berba, are you there? Yes, po. Not to can call on the now? line, but to call on the... <laughs> the another uh, online yes i can hear you okay go ahead okay okay so uh you will run my powerpoint slides can i can we start i'm supposed to start uh, talking about the future of infectious diseases in the philippines so uh can you see my slides na ba okay wala pa wala pa Sorry po, I was having so much problems with connections. Eh. But uh, they have my slides na. And uh, I wanted to speak about the... Uh... There you go. Let's, let's wait for it lang. I think they're trying to load it. And, okay. So first of all, I'd like to really thank you for inviting us here. So next, please. Next part. Okay. So these are my disclosures. I have no conflict of interest. I work at the UPPGH primarily. Okay, next. Uh, I'm an infectious disease specialist. I work at UP Manila and also at the medical city. I'm also part of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Disease. Next, please. So if you can press the um, video. Yeah. So we would see na how much COVID-19 has uh, been so problematic over the last several months. So here we don't see yet the effect of... Uh, the number of deaths over the top 10 causes of uh, death globally. But here we see this uh, blue bar 
climbing up ever so slowly until it reaches almost as close to how much tuberculosis is giving us globally as a problem. Okay. And we don't know whether in a few weeks that uh, it will soon supersede the number of uh, global deaths for both tuberculosis and diabetes. So next, please. So next, is somebody um the secretariat or my team? Next slide, now please. Ayan, thank you, Pop. So here we identify the priority infectious diseases at this time, other than pan other than the COVID pandemic. So we have tuberculosis, HIV/AIDS, the problem of antimicrobial resistance the problem of emerging and re-emerging infections, and of course, the big group of vaccine-preventable diseases and the current problem of vaccine hesitancy. Next, please, next slide. And here are the specific issues of concern for each of the, uh, for each of the illnesses that we described earlier. There might be concerns about access to care, about diagnostics, about vaccine hesitancy. Issues and surveillance, and of course, uh, manpower problems. Next slide, please. So what do we want to see improved in the big realm of public health and infectious disease in current setup? So we'd like some improvements in disease surveillance, improvements for emergency preparedness and outbreak response, how we... Uh, respond to disease-specific uh, problems, public health workforce development, and problems related to occupational, environmental, and public health. And of course, a lot to do with the research. Next, please. So, the on uh, looking at it at a different perspective, I think some of the concerns has to do with the cascading of what we learn from research. So things begin with a, a infectious disease and public health has to do with a lot of uh, research. So we do a lot of pioneering research in diagnostics, treatment, and uh, prevention. But uh, there's a lot of concern about all of the findings in this pioneer researches cascading into actual applications in our daily lives. So there needs to be that uh, connection that uh, allows movement of information and all the advances that we reach in terms of research towards actual application through solutions, actual real life solutions, through clinical practice guidelines and the uh, strengthening of surveillance systems. And then further on to actually deploying all of these new findings and disseminating new discoveries so that it reaches uh, people who need it the most. Next, please. So our proposal, I really only have one proposal, Senator Pia. And this, but this is a very ambitious proposal, and it is to create a national institute for infectious disease. And you would see here that actually it's really to house all of these uh, concerns and problems related and strategies related to a good response for infectious diseases. So the diagrams below show that uh, if we do have the National Institute, a National Public Health Institute or a National Institute for Infectious Diseases, we would, we would be able to house all these concepts and all these strategies under one roof. Next, please. So there's actually, um, we propose to use the NPHI or the National Public Health Institute model that is used worldwide 
And this will allow us to have a strengthened national system to respond to infectious diseases and will significantly save lives, improve outcomes, and reduce not only mortality but morbidity. The exemplary examples of such national public health institutes are, of course, the CDC of the United States, the China CDC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and even many other countries like the National Institute for Health and Welfare of Finland. There's an umbrella, next please. There's an umbrella organization that oversees this, the International Association of National Public Health Institutes, and they're really into creating, developing, connecting, and transforming all of the public health institutes across the world so that there's an overall global uh, increase in health capacity. So the next slide, next please. When I was looking into this, I was actually very, very surprised that we're not part of the long list of countries with existing national institutes for public health. There's now 82 countries. And next please and 23 other countries that are all into this National Institutes for Public Health. So maybe it's time that we, we build our own Institute for Public Health and Infectious Disease. Next, please. The youngest one, the one that was just launched last year in 2019, is actually the National Center of Infectious Disease in Singapore. And uh, I was able to visit this twice in 2018 and 2019. And it is uh, visiting this very uh, magnificent, actually, 330-bed uh, large, tall uh, edifice uh, that is meant to strengthen Singapore's capability to, to be able to respond quickly, efficiently, and effectively against infectious diseases, as we saw in this uh, COVID pandemic. The National Center of Infectious Disease in Singapore is actually under the Ministry of Health of Singapore. So next, please. There's no one model for the National Institute. So some countries make the National Institute very, very, very large scale, uh, leading the national, all the national efforts and uh, overlooking all all the strategies related to the control of infectious disease. Some other countries just have some core missions, like just surveillance. Some countries started it in the 1940s, like the United States, and some other countries just recently started it. But the main thing is that these national institutes need to be dynamic, they need to be resilient, they need to be able to adapt to new challenges, and they really should be science-based organizations that are driven by data and evidence. So I think it's really time for our country, next please, to start something that for now we will call, next slide please, for now we will call maybe the best name might be the National Institute for Infectious Disease or NIID. And I think the main arms will be discovery and development, uh, meaning research. Next would be application and education. And the third arm will be deployment or dissemination of information that comes from this NIID. Uh, next, please. There's a lot of document that uh, describes the framework and the national attributes of what this national institute should be. Uh, and it's listed here. And in the interest of time, I won't go into that. Just that it's very important that the institute has a national scope. So it's not just the city or it's not just the university, but it serves the whole Filipino people and our country. And it has national recognition. Next. Next, please. The, our proposed specific functions of the NIID 
will really be to fill in the gaps in existing functions. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We know that the DOH is really doing a good job. The RITM is there. There's the National Institutes of Health. And there are many other existing infectious disease and slash public health centers. And we'd like to just harmonize what everybody is doing and fill in the gaps. So the list here we, we put here in this slide uh, are things that we think there might be a, a space for improvement and some tweaking so that when the next pandemic comes, we're more ready to, to respond uh, in a more uh, efficient manner. Next, please. So our proposed organization, as I said, is that there should be no duplication of tasks and responsibilities, but definitely clearer accountabilities, some check and balance. So for example, if there's a group, I think the main reason why I'd like to pursue this is that um, there would be some check and balance. It's not just the Department of Health that's uh, leading us, but there's another group who will be leading and guiding the whole process of our responses, for example, for outbreak control or uh, management and control of specific infectious diseases. This will allow optimization of collaboration and also harmonized expertise and existing strengths. We, th we think that the NIID for now will be under the National Institutes of Health under the UP Manila. And this will also make uh, possible the presence of academic partnership among all the centers in the Philippines right now um, that uh, work on infectious disease. It's really just the National Institutes of Health, which will probably be able to uh, give us the academic partnership that is uh, needed and looked for by other partners across the world. So when can, next please, what can the NIID add to the current setup? So next slide, please. Other countries, the National Public Health Institutes usually lead in the national efforts. So when there's an outbreak, they're the first ones to respond. They lead in disease surveillance. They guide how laboratory services should be. They give input to health programs and how workforce should be developed and where research should be prioritized. So this is the gaps that we were talking about of what NIID can do to the, our current Philippine setup. Next, please. In other countries, these kinds of institutes also allow uh, governments to be able to uh, address and assess threats to current um, government setups and programs. And it also allows the development of very strong and robust scientific evidence-based policies and strategies. So um, the, the presence of public health institutes, national public health institutes, uh, foster evidence-based approaches, which are necessary so that government policies are based more uh, based more uh, on scientific evidence rather than on politics. The initial steps that we'd like to take next, please. If we were going to start off, sabi nga nila, ngayong may COVID pandemic, dapat iniisip na natin how to be able to cope with the next pandemic. So we should start these initial steps. And we think we would like to start off with mapping out the stakeholders, what's there and what needs to be done, develop a strategic policy and plan that will be aligned towards what needs to be done, the priorities, determine if any policy changes needs to, be, needs to happen and create a sustainability plan. 
If we need technical expertise, again, there's all this global collaboration that we can uh, seek for. So this is about working together where we, we, if we set up this NIID, will not re reinvent the wheel. We will keep all the gears and the wheels working, but we'll try to harmonize what everybody is doing. So there will be the academe, there will be the professional societies, uh, professional societies that are special specialists in the broader societies like the PAFP, the PCOM, the P PCP, the PPS, the POGS, and the group of uh, public health specialists. And of course, there will always be DOH and RITM and the private sector to be there to again, co-work with all of this in place. So this is all about collaboration and working together. Next, please. So um, I'd like to just quote, this is very interesting for me. Next, please. See, Bill Gates himself said, next, po next slide, na in crisis, in any crisis, leaders have two equally important responsibilities to solve the current problem and also to think forward so it does not happen, the problem does not happen again. And that's, as Bill Gates said, this is an excellent case in point, the current COVID-19 pandemic, because while we're trying to solve this COVID-19 pandemic now, we need to think of ways that it will not happen again. So, I'd like to, next slide, just um, show you what some may be the beginning of the future of infectious disease that we're trying to develop at the UPPGH. Uh, we're trying to build a Bayanihan na. We're calling Bayanihan na. Yun yung title ng isolation complex. Next, please. This is a private-public partnership. The rationale is to create a space for COVID-19 patients uh, that will be separate from the main hospital. It will be state-of-the-art isolation facility and uh, with all of the negative pressure, UV light, filtered uh, exhaust systems, air pocket mechanisms. And um, not only will it be used for COVID-19 now, but it will be uh, when we designed it, it will be something that we can use for future outbreaks in infectious disease like measles, polio in the future, and to prepare uh, us, our systems, to handle victims of biologic and chemical warfare. Next, please. This will be a, a 39 patient capacity. So nine ICU beds and 30 regular beds. It will look something like this. Next, please. So may maliit pong kalye between the OPD and the main hospital. So it's like putting a Lego uh, work there. Parang ipapatong siya sa kalye muna. And it will be good for three to four years. So it will answer our needs and maybe the start of the future infectious disease institute. Next, please. So aerial view would look something like this. It will uh, be matched to the space of the kalye, no? so street, kaya pahaba po siya. But it will be state of the art. Next, please. So the nurses stations will be computerized systems or there will be mechanisms to see patients from inside. Next. And the beds. Next, please. Because of the space limitation, the this was uh, very precisely calculated, the bed spaces in between, but it will meet the requirements, the international requirements for isolation facilities. Next, please. So, yun. That's it na po. So, uh, hopefully, we'll consider the possibility of... Uh, this uh, National Institute for Infectious Disease. It's very timely that you've asked us from the 
uh, university and also from the Philippine Society of Infectious Disease to uh, talk about this. I think this is something that uh, we need in the country. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Burba. Um, just a quick response. Uh, actually, in the presentations that I give outside of this hearing for the committee uh, to explain the work of the committee, um, I always use a slide of uh, Bill Gates and an article that shows that Taiwan is already preparing for the next pandemic. So that's really our objective in this committee to uh, use futures thinking and prepare. Um, like I said, now, of course, we have to start somewhere and that somewhere is now. <laughs> Um, but it's really intended for the preparation of the future. And the second point I wanted to mention is that there are bills on uh, the creation of a CDC type of, um, uh, well, it's called the CDC, actually. I don't know if you, you have copies of that, but I can ask my team to uh, check with you because I'd like to um, align those bills with uh, your recommendations also. So I'll just ask my team to get in touch with you. Thank you very Thank much you for very your time. Yes, and for your patience logging on. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you okay, um, our, our next speaker is um, Dr. Eileen Espina. She's, uh, well, she was on the Filipino health sociology, health behaviors based on social determinants. So she's a family medicine specialist. Um, and, uh, Tora, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, can I be allowed to share screen, please? Um, I sent my slides po earlier to your staff, to the yes. email. Uh, uh, para po, kung pwede, sila na lang po ang mag-share. Um, can, can somebody uh, no, um, take care of the slides? You have it? Uh, pwede naman, ma'am. Ako na lang po. Anyway, they, there. Is that you? Uh, ikaw, ikaw na? Okay. Ikaw na yan. Okay, sige. Sure, whatever works. Um, nakikita na po. Is my slides... Ano na po? Nakikita na siya sa visible on the screen? Yes, yes, we can see okay. it. Okay, so good afternoon po sa ating lahat. At I would like to thank the good senator for the invitation to be part of this joint public hearing of the Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation and Futures Thinking, and the Committee on Health and Demography. Ako po ay si Aileen Espina. Ako po ay isang family physician by training and a public health practitioner for the better part of my almost 25 years of medical practice. Para po sa hindi pamilyar sa aming specialty ng family and community medicine, it is a field of medicine that specializes in the care of families using a patient-centered, um, family-focused, community-oriented approach. And we pride ourselves in saying that we do not treat diseases, but we take care of people from womb to tomb. We are a recognized specialty in the Philippines by the Department of Health, uh, PRC, PhilHealth, and the PMA. So my task this afternoon is to share uh, our uh, how we view health behavior and how it is shaped by the social determinants of health and disease. So social determinants as defined are the conditions in which we are born into. Ito po yung kung saan tayo ipinanganak, saan tayo lumaki, saan tayo nagkamulat, saan tayo nagkaisip, where we work, age, and eventually die. And um, these social determinants play a very big role po in health outcomes. Yung nakikita po natin na health, dis uh, health outcomes, the diseases, is just the tip of the iceberg. Because actually, if you look at it, it is a product po of an interplay uh, between a lot of factors. Okay, so yung health determinants po natin, as, as shown in this pie chart, um, napakalaki po ng role ng health behavior. It accounts for 30%. Access to clinical care is only responsible for 10%. The physical environment, another 10%. Our genetic makeup and biology, 10%. And social and economic factors at 40%. So as mentioned po in the previous slide, health does not begin in the doctor's office. 
In my experience po, when I consult a patient in the clinic, pag isa lang po ang pasyente na nasa harap ko, pero actually po, dala-dala po niya ang maraming bagay. We are seeing in one patient, actually, his family history, ang entire uh, genetic lineage po niya, no? the heredo familial diseases nila, kung saan po siya nakatira, saan po siya nagtatrabaho, ano po yung mga health beliefs na nag-shape ng kanyang health-seeking behavior. For example po sa panahon ngayon ng COVID, sinabi po ni, ng ating good speaker from UP Diliman na a common symptom like cough or fever, pwede po siyang hindi pansinin, no? So, sometimes we see a patient in our clinic na limang araw na pong may nararamdaman. So, it, is, it was ingrained in us early on in our training that we have to determine ano po ang rason kung bakit po ang pasyente nagpapatingin. Patients do not seek medical care because of the illness per se. But rather, it is the anxiety caused by the illness that pushes the, pe the person to seek medical care. It is what we call as the emotionally critical misperception, which we must be able to correctly identify because a lot of the treatment plan is hinged upon it. It's very important for us doctors to understand where our patients are coming from. Their health behavior reflects the interplay between them and the contextual factors or the conditions that he is currently in. These health behaviors um, is a reflection of what he has experienced and is an embodiment of the biopsychosocial factors that, uh, that um, has shaped the way he's thinking. So, ito pong sinatawag nating health literacy. Hindi po ibig sabihin na kung nakapagtapos kayo ng kolehiyo, eh, literate na po kayo sa health. Minsan po, maraming technical jargons ang health. So, dapat po, kami ring mga doktor, we should be careful and we should be mindful when talking to our patients. Fully respectful kung ano po dapat ang pag uh, pag-relay namin po when we do health education so that pareho po, po ang, ang understanding namin ng pasyente. We also have to honor their health practices which has been defined by sociocultural norms and their religious beliefs. And it has also been shaped and influenced by their experiences with the health care system. A lot of our health practices and health-seeking behavior are learned in our family of orientation kung saan po tayo pinanganak at namulat. These health practices are usually um, pinamana pa po. It's a multi-generational thing. And as uh, previously mentioned, it is a communal experience. So dapat po maintindihan po natin yun as doctors. So in this pandemic, uh, it was mentioned po that behavior was the hardest thing to manage. Biology was the easiest part. Parami na po tayong alam about COVID, no? Um, pero ang behavior po talaga, no, nakikita natin and we hear it in many forums and communication platforms na kaya daw mataas ang kaso natin ng COVID kasi pasaway ang Pinoy. Pero bakit po pasaway? Kailangan po kasi nating maintindihan kung bakit po naging ganun. For example, sinasabi po natin, kailangan maghugas ng kamay. Meron po ba silang tubig at sabon sa kanilang bahay? Wearing a mask, where will they get the mask? How will they throw the mask? So, kailangan pong tingnan po natin yung kabuuan na yun. Hindi po siya dapat uh, isang one-track mind lang po, kundi dapat titingnan po natin yung buong sistema. It should be a systemic approach. Okay? So, I am not many, making any excuses, but we have to understand po the home conditions. I fully believe that the home is the real health front line. It is in our families where we are first introduced to the concepts of health and disease. And all our actions are influenced by the practices that we see in our homes. For example po, I have a patient na hypertensive, bibigyan ko po ng dietary prescription, pero pagdating naman ng bahay nila, hindi po nagdadayat yung ibang kasama sa bahay, kumakain pa rin po sila ng uh, mga bawal na pagkain, to the point po na yung pasyente po, eh, napitempt din po na i-break yung kanyang diet. So, usually po, dapat ang ating pag-treat po sa pasyente should be as a family unit. In our families din po, we assume 
uh, we have unique dynamics and we take on particular roles. Meron po talagang parang uh, unofficially siya po ang caregiver and usually po siya ang nanay or ang ate or ang lola. Then we have the health educators. Then we have the decision makers. It is very important for us to understand who uh, assumes this role so that when we partner for health delivery and disaster risk reduction, um, mas magiging madali po ang ating gagawing uh, health education messaging. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this no, in, in the context of COVID, how we can harness the family. So I applied po the disaster risk formula to the context of the family by, by computing po uh, yung risk ng isang pamilya based on their exposure, their vulnerability, and their capacity and the available community resources. We, we, need, to, we need to be able to tap into, into their capacity, ano po yung meron sila at ano po meron ang komunidad. Nang sa ganun po ay matulungan po natin ang mga pamilya natin na mas magiging asset po, they will become an enabler, hindi lamang po sa COVID, kundi sa uh, mga darating pa pong sakuna, disaster or emergency in the future. Okay, so this is po our framework of a community-based approach with the family or the household at the core. Okay, ang COVID po, um, unfortunately, no, it has unmasked na marami po talaga tayong uh, mga dapat baguhin sa ating uh, komunidad, sa ating society. We have seen uh, yung age old, matagal na pong mga problema sa ating healthcare system, ang commercialization ng healthcare, the focus so much on hospitals and prison. Kaya parang ito po dapat siguro ang dapat pong ayusin no? in, in, in the future. We should have investments. This is my wish, uh, Senator Pia, na investments should be made to address the underlying determinants of health so that we could build community resilience. Um, one of the things po which I would really, uh, I'm praying for is the realization of the universal health care law of having a primary care physician for every Filipino family who can provide them, who will take care of them from womb to tomb, no? first in, last out. They will, who will provide them first contact, comprehensive, coordinated, and continuing care. Para po yung usual practice natin ngayon, na curative and episodic care ay matigil na po. And then, care should be accessible. It should be community-based. Hindi po siya dapat hospital-centric because majority of our illnesses can actually be handled at the primary care level. There should also be moves to address the maldistribution of healthcare workers as presented earlier by Dr. Dans. Ito po yung tools that I am, I am foreseeing that will be uh, seen in the new normal. I hope that there will be more emphasis on wellness, on the wellness, illness, wellness continuum, um, the use of telehealth. So, kailangan po talagang ayusin ang ICT infrastructure natin and then come up with, with laws to cover for telemedicine, data privacy, and, and telehealth services, including po paano po ang pagbayad ng telehealth services natin. Um, a lot of our patients um, feel na parang Hindi nila ma-imagine baka sila magbabayad for telehealth, hindi naman daw sila namin nakita physically. And also for the medical education curriculum, kasi nasanay po talaga kami na we do physical exam and history taking na hinahawakan namin yung pasyente. So we also need to be trained on how to um, use um, telehealth po yung mga new modalities uh, for virtual physical exam, for virtual consults, monitoring, and follow-up. On task shifting, ito po yung inaano natin na hindi po lahat ng bagay sa pagmamonitor ng pasyente ay eh, kailangang doktor po ang gumagawa. So yung dati pong uh, structure wherein the, the doctor is at the top of the of the heap ng, ng ating healthcare pyramid, uh, pwede na po nating pag-isipan kung paano po natin magagawa through um, amendments to the Midwifery Act, to the Nursing Care Act, and to the other healthcare professionals, kung ano po ang mga health uh, delivery serv health services na pwede pong ma-deliver ng other healthcare workers. In fact, we're already seeing models like this wherein even the, the family members are being asked to do certain things in 
in healthcare delivery like monitoring of blood pressure, administration of insulin, and um, uh, monitoring of blood sugar in the home setting. Sana din po on service level allocation, ma maipasa may sakat we will may sakat katuparan sorry po uh, we will be able to implement po yung entry point of care should be primary care para po hindi po kung sa ang level po we will have patients uh, being given the right care at the right time at the right place uh, so that this will also ensure that our tertiary care uh, facilities will not be taking care of patients na hindi po appropriate sa level nila. Primary care services, primary care cases should go to primary care services. Um, medyo kailangan po talaga ito ng matindi-tinding uh, education on the part of the patient because there would really be a big paradigm shift in, in how healthcare is being delivered and how healthcare is being accessed. Thank you po. Maraming salamat for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, Doctora. Um, we appreciate that, and uh, we'll get back to you for some of the specific recommendations that you made, which I feel uh, we can also pass on to the IATF. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So our next speaker is um, Dr. JJ Hermar. She's a, a clinical associate professor for ob Obigaini Department in the University of the Philippines. So, Dr. JJ, you have the floor. Okay, thanks. I can't hear you. I'm on mute. I have there. To... Yeah. yeah, they unmuted you now. You have slides. Okay, there, there, there. Hi. So, um, good afternoon, Senator P. And thank you for this opportunity to present um, our plans for the UP College of Medicine Clinical Simulation Center. We, our students prepared a video. I will just show that and then I will supplement with a very short PowerPoint presentation. So, can we show the video? I sent it early on. Can I ask the team to show the video? Yes, there, are you on it? There you go. Okay. There's no sound yet. No sound, no sound yet. Uh -oh. <laughs> Wala pa rin the sound. I think they weren't able to Naman the sound. I'm checking with them what's okay. going on. It's okay. You want to can share mine and then. Uh... I can share my the video na lang from my side. 
Okay, better. You can do that. I think that's better. At the end of the last century, multiple reports from the World Health Organization have reported on persistent gaps in healthcare quality and safety across the world. Each year, 134 million adverse events occur in hospitals in low- and middle-income countries due to unsafe care, resulting in 2.6 million deaths. Safety of patients during the provision of health services that are safe and of high quality is a prerequisite for strengthening healthcare systems and making progress towards effective universal health coverage under Sustainable Development Goal 3. In the Philippines, we have documented high rates of preventable medical errors, which demand a fundamental change in the healthcare delivery system. Simulation in healthcare creates a safe learning environment that allows researchers and practitioners to test new clinical processes and enhance individual and team skills before encountering patients. The demands of clinical care are sensitive to errors, and the stakes are high if errors occur. Healthcare simulation is an instructional medium used for education, assessment, and research, which includes several modalities that have in common the reproduction of certain characteristics of clinical reality. Practice through simulation can reduce the cognitive load of the staff involved in patient care, thereby helping to mitigate errors in times of pressure and exhaustion. Simulation to enhance patient safety has four general purposes. Number one, education through comprehensive clinical skills training. This is envisioned as an interdisciplinary center that draws from the expertise and commitment of the faculty of the UP College of Medicine, allied health professionals, and simulation specialists. Number two, assessment. The facilities are designed to provide advanced assessment approaches for clinical and objective structured clinical exams. A video capture system that will ensure objective assessment and advanced data analysis will be beneficial for both formative and summative assessments. It is also designed as a venue for high stakes examinations for diplomat certification of healthcare professionals across all specialties. Number three, research. The center is envisioned to contribute to research by identifying more advanced and effective methods of teaching and learning. Simulation can be a diagnostic tool to understand the sources of errors in team settings. More importantly, the center will provide a venue where our healthcare professionals can train on developing innovative gadgets, tools, and task trainers that will impact on patients with specific needs. Number four, health system integration and interprofessional collaboration, a venue for continuing medical education of healthcare professionals. Protocols from interprofessional collaboration can be applied first before having to apply them to patients. Competency acquisition in a safe environment. Individual dynamic medical management exercises may include high fidelity simulations that utilize anatomically accurate mannequins and vital sign monitors with graphically real images on screen. Behaviorally trained standardized patients with task trainers also facilitate an unfolding realistic scenario. Patient safety may also be enhanced through full scenario team management in which a human patient simulator and fully simulated care environment such as entire operating rooms or emergency department base are utilized. Training using virtual computer-based simulation is critical for disaster management, including pandemic response. Simulations improve patient safety by allowing physicians to become better trained without putting patients at risk and, importantly, by providing protected time for reflection and debriefing where most of the learning takes place. The simulation needs to feel real enough for participants to be able to suspend their disbelief, enabling them to feel think and act much as they would in a real scenario. This also enables behaviorally appropriate actions. A simulation-based training curriculum for pediatric residents using high fidelity models was associated with increases in performance of basic clinical procedural skills, such as bag mask ventilation, venipuncture, peripheral venous catheter placement, and lumbar puncture. Simulation training for laparoscopic cholecystectomy was associated with improved performance threefold fewer errors, an eightfold decreased variation in error making, and increased respect for tissue during the procedure. A workshop that used simulation exercises for common obstetric emergencies like shoulder dystocia, 
postpartum hemorrhage, eclampsia, delivery of twins, breech presentation, adult resuscitation, and neonatal resuscitation showed that there was a statistically significant decrease in the rate of births with poor APGAR scores and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. A prospective before-after study examined resuscitation outcomes after implementation of the team STEPS team building program, coupled with simulation. This study reported several improvements in communication, as well as reductions in time to computed tomography, intubation, and the operating room. In March of 2020, the coronavirus disease pandemic forced medical schools in the Philippines to stop face-to-face -face learning activities and abruptly shift to an online curriculum. Those in the clinical rotations were removed from direct patient care. The pandemic presents a learning opportunity for students and practicing healthcare workers to improve the healthcare system's response to unprecedented public health concerns. Now more than ever, it is critical that our medical schools and hospitals look to modern simulation practices to train our healthcare workers, not only to keep patients alive, but how to keep themselves safe. The need to prepare future physicians has never been as focused as it is now in the setting of a global emergency. This is an opportune time to contribute to the advancement of medical education in the setting of active curricular innovations and transformations. Many improvements in medical education are a natural consequence of disruptive movements. We need to ensure the competence, resilience, and professionalism of our healthcare workers before they go to the front lines. This is the commitment of the UP College of Medicine, a clinical skills simulation center that will be the training hub for medical simulation in the country and in the region. The UP College of Medicine Clinical Skills Simulation Center, a center for simulation-based education, training, collaboration, and research. Okay, so I will now show you the short, I'll just give you a short PowerPoint presentation on here it is okay just to supplement the video you know, so um okay so the mission of the up college of medicine um, clinical simulation center is to provide a learning opportunity to improve patient and healthcare worker safety before the pandemic we we envisioned it only for patient safety but now with the pandemic we included healthcare worker safety through experiential learning deliberate practice interprofessional team training and innovative research so um we have to provide comprehensive clinical skills training Traditionally, we were taught with um, learning by doing or see one, do one um, approach. Now, so we used to teach, uh, we teach, that's how we learned also. We teach our students by um, showing them how to do it. And then after a while, we assist them probably once or twice, and then they're on their own. And we do this on real patients. Now, um, the way simulation-based education is, is you can do it in, High, using high fidelity models or task trainers, and you break down into steps. So, so education is different. So you prepare them, you lecture them, you tell them the rationale per step, and you break down the skill into steps, and then you brief them, you make them, you demonstrate how to do it. And you do it in a safe environment no? so and then they will do the steps themselves and then when after everything is done you debrief them you tell them what was wrong with the step that they did what went right how did they feel about it and then they develop competence through deliberate practice and then that's when you assess them no? so everything is experiential and then you can the teaching or the skill training is reusable and you can standardize for cleaning and assessment so this is how this is the floor plan of the center. We are building it already. The, cent, the building is um, for, to be completed by the middle or the third quarter of this year. And this is the floor plan. So you will see that um, some units, for example, this one can be an emergency room, and then this can be converted into a mock operating room or a mock um, intensive care unit. No? So I'll go through that one by one. So clinical skills lab, we teach them actual um, uh, 
uh, physical examination skills, diagnostic procedures, and management strategies. And then the critical care unit um, will focus on procedures for critically ill, and they can, for example, airway management, um, how to approach or how to manage these patients. Then the operating room will simulate um, a surgical suite and we can teach them from the start, no, from the time you intubate the patient or prepare the patient for anesthesia, the surgery, surgical steps itself. And then you also have interprofessional collaboration. You train the nurses as well. You train the entire team. Um, the endoscop uh, endoscopy unit will have an endoscopic simulator that will um, use minimally invasive procedures and instead of doing it on a live patient, you do it virtually, and we can teach them the skills and we can do constant evaluation, and this can also be used for research. The birth simulation unit will not just house a normal, uh, will not just, we won't just perform normal deliveries or show them how to do um, cesarean sections or spontaneous deliveries. We can also teach them emergency drills on, for example, how to manage patients with obstetric hemorrhage, with seizure disorders, or hypertension in pregnancy. And then for the patient safety procedures unit, which should also be part of it, we have a program for radiation protection for the healthcare workers, for the radiologists, for the non-doctor healthcare workers as well. For the emergency trauma and disaster, there are software available that will mimic a disaster, and then we can train our teams into disaster um, response. And this, the safety protocols will also be tested in the center to validate processes in a safe setting. And then now, the more important one is the pandemic response unit. As we said, this, this is not the the last and only pandemic, we should be preparing for the next one. And this will include like donning and doffing, how, for example, you will handle a patient for surgery who is COVID positive from the transport to the induction of anesthesia, the surgical steps, until you care for her in the recovery room. So these are just the examples of the trainers that you've seen in the video, no? but there are high fidelity um, simulators, there are task trainers, simpler, and then we also have virtual reality simulators. And this is the rendering of the center. As I've said, the, the suites can be converted into an ICU, an ER, an operating room. Okay, and then this one will show you, like for example, how it's done that the faculty is behind this glass wall, and then you can see that um, as the students are performing the task, we videotape them, and then after we show them step by step what they did right, what they did wrong, and so you are able to debrief and give them feedback. And then it's used for assessment as well. So um, now what we do is we, we observe their skill in real time, handing a patient. But this one, the objective assessment can be done in a safe environment. And this is not only done for medical students. You can do this for high stakes exam, meaning for diplomate certification, for subspecialty board certification as well. So this is the other level. So the one I showed you earlier in this is in one level of the building. And this is on this another level where we, we plan to do assessment. So the student can, can see what's going on or what the case is or the clinical scenario before she enters the room and then she enters with either a high fidelity model or a standardized patient. A standardized patient is a, a, an actor that you train to, to mimic or to have a disease and to react to the student accordingly. You know, depending on what the student will do, then he will react accordingly. Okay, then while doing that, the faculty is here behind to assess what's going on and he, she can evaluate the student. No? Okay, then in terms of research, it could be a diagnostic tool to understand the sources of errors in team settings. And we plan to make it a center where we can collaborate with other universities and other, in not only in the Philippines, but also in the region. So it can be a venue where we can test innovative gadgets, tools, and even local task trainers, or we plan that in the future we are able to make our own task trainers, our own simulators that will be relevant to the Philippine setting.
So, and then it's also an area where we can um, provide a venue for healthcare professionals to, to interact and we can have competency acquisition across professions. So not only among doctors, but among nurses, there's assistants, midwives, no? um, in a safe environment. Okay, so moving forward, we plan to be accredited by the Society of Simulation and Healthcare so that we are recognized not only in the Philippines, but in the region as well. So we plan to provide basic courses, introduce new programs into the curriculum of our university and also across disciplines in other universities. We also plan to provide um, curriculum development for, for other universities and centers here and in Asia. And then we plan to collaborate with other centers for simulation-based education in healthcare. So um, what we plan to be in the future is really a national and even a regional center for simulation-based education, training, collaboration, and research. Thank you again for this opportunity, Senator Kaita. Thank you. I did realize that um, it's meant to be a simulation training center open to not just UP, ano pala, not just UP students. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because we plan to be a national center for training also, right. and also to provide um, specialty assessment for for structured assessment for other disciplines as well. And it's not limited to just um, the UP. Right, right. Okay. So yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for in terms of the future of health because nga, this is what we need to do now to yes. prepare and you know um do use whatever resources are available out there in the world mm -hmm. to bring ourselves up to speed. You know, our I mean everybody praises the Filipinos for the human resource, you know, for for their talent, for their CPAG and all that. But, um, you know, if you can elevate that by using resources available e elsewhere, I think that would, that's really what we need to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's for, for a layman like me, that's more than enough information. <laughs> um, I'd be interested in the cost. Um, that's not a, yeah. that's not a concern per se of this committee, but um, it, it happens that I do chair the, the hearings and i will defend the budget um uh not on health though um on education yes. so to that extent uh up's up's budget is there in the committee on education mm -hmm. uh, on the committee on the committee on finance budget of education and so since this is technically a up budget that is something that concerns me in my other yeah, um, yeah. when i air, when i wear my other hat so I don't know if you have those figures in mind, but uh, did you have those figures yeah. off the top? Yeah, it's in the it's in the um, I sent the uh, capsule. I think okay. the budget. It's yeah, it's there. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. And then um, maybe we can get some pictures. This is more for the committee report, not to help yeah. people visualize. That was the reason for this hearing, really, to help people visualize is what are the investments we need to make. To yes, yes. that future of health. Yeah. So that's very helpful. And then especially when you point out that this will be uh, a training center for all, um, you know, that, that's part of UP's mandate anyway. Um, that's very helpful. All right. Thank you. As I said, for my layman understanding. <laughs> The students made that video really to for us for for you for everybody to understand what simulation is. Very nice. <laughs> please tell them with their permission. I'll actually show that when I sponsor the committee report. I say it's very it's major futuristic in the thing yade, but it, it really shows what kind of investments now that we have to make. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have like like the other comments I gave. I'll. I'm sure I'll have future conversations with you on this. It's been yes. more than three hours. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy and, and grateful for everyone who attended. Thank you, Dr. JJ. Yes, thank and, you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay, wait a minute. My staff is saying that... Okay, um, yes, let me just... Um, acknowledge other resource person who are here they're not speaking today 
but um, I asked them to attend so that we can have uh, as, as our um, one of the first speakers we had early on said that it's so important because 20 only 20 percent of the health issues are within the um, immediate um, realm of, of the health departments or the health agencies. The other 80% happen outside. That's why I felt it's very important that these other agencies, other representatives are here. So we do have representatives from the National Nutrition Council, Executive Director Asusena Dayanghirang, um, from UP Manila, Dr. Uh, Menchit Padilla, from DOH, Dr. Eric Tayag, who spoke earlier, uh, and Director uh, Maria Teresa Vera, from RITM, Dr. Ditanko, from SSS, Dr. Roberto Putong and Mark Moterde from PhilHealth, Dr. Andre Monte, and our local futures thinking expert, Dr. Professor Sherman Cruz. Um, and of course, we have our representatives from DAP, Dr. Lizan Kalina, and um, from Department of Agriculture, USEC, uh, Rodolfo Vicera, from FDA Director General um, Domingo. So we will have another hearing. So I will just suspend this hearing for today and hope to see all of you who can afford. Um, I know that doctors are very busy. I hope this was not an added task or at least worth your time. But if you need a break and want to listen to these uh, kind of uh, discussions, we, we are having one again. Uh, we will reset it, but I think it will be in two weeks time. Pa. So again, thank you everyone. Um, the hearing is suspended. Stay safe and uh, thank you for your time.